Hi! As the title to this video indicates, I played all the main Final Fantasy games in the pandemic. It was an awesome experience, and a few viewers were interested in me making a video about it, so here it is. I didn't know how to edit video or do any part of this, so it was a very fun learning experience. I'm, I'm fairly sure anyone who knows what they're doing would be horrified by the way I assembled it in DaVinci Resolve. The program barely functioned by the end. I'm going to briefly explain why I played them all and then talk about each game individually. That's why this video is so long. It's just a few minutes, but about a lot of games. I don't know who the audience for this is other than the two people who wanted me to make it, but honestly, I'm just happy if those two are happy. So. In short, I got into the series as a small child with Final Fantasy Mystic Quest, although I briefly played 4 first. And then when 6 came out, it became and still is my favorite game of all time. But then I didn't like 7, and when future games looked to be more in that style, I left the series and I didn't come back again until the COVID-19 pandemic gave me the time and the motivation. Everyone was raving about the 7 remake, so I gave the original another try, enjoyed it, and then moved on to play 1 through 9. I was completely hooked again. And my Disney-loving friend Christine, who made me a Moogle, had put up with so much of my raving about Final Fantasy that I decided to split the difference and stream Kingdom Hearts so that she could see it. I stream at twitch.tv slash pavan if anyone is curious, but only rarely when a new game comes out and I just want to share it with friends. But before doing Kingdom Hearts, I wanted to do Final Fantasy X since I knew some of those characters were involved. And when I streamed 10, despite just streaming for a couple friends, I started getting a few new viewers who just liked old Final Fantasy games and wanted to chat about it. And this evolved into trying to play every numbered game and its direct sequel before 16's release in 2023. This means I did 10-2 and Lightning Returns, but not Crisis Core. I also played the most available versions, so for example, I only know Final Fantasy XII with the Zodiac Age changes. It sounds like they really improved the experience. And it was great to have people cheering me along and just geeking out about these with me. One new viewer, Ocean, shout out to him, had me assemble tier lists after each game to gauge how we were feeling about them and really encouraged the idea of me making a video about it. I couldn't include everything I wanted to because this video was already three hours long and I could only spend so much time going through four hour streams to find five second clips to highlight a point. Since I started from zero skill with editing, having only used this account once before to put up a couple of weirdly low-resolution videos of Magic the Gathering's Vintage Championships one year, this isn't a super smooth video. I knew how long and difficult a process it would be, so I went in knowing it was going to be uh, quite the hassle, and I'm just glad it got done. I, I wanted to race to get this out before Seven Rebirths uh, release, which as of this moment is in about 26 hours. So. There's that. Uh, I, I've even already played the demo for it, and you'll find some of that footage sprinkled in here. And if you're wondering why I didn't talk about this or that, just look at the link to the video. I just want to say this was a tremendous experience, and I loved all but two of the games. This also came out to an ungodly amount of hundreds and hundreds of hours of playtime, so I almost feel the need to preemptively say that during this time I was fully employed, I lost 60 pounds, which is why I look different in some of the clips from, say, Final Fantasy V, which were taken earlier than the others, and I finally read War and Peace, among many other classics. But even if I hadn't been able to do all of those other things, this was enriching on its own and a pretty good way to spend my time. So let's go to the games in numerical order. Final Fantasy I, now in a playable version. So I first played Final Fantasy I on my NES as a child, which was at some time after I had played Final Fantasy IV and Mystic Quest. I never got very far in it. I would guess probably about as far as the infamous Marsh Cave and no further. That's because Final Fantasy I is hard in the way that old NES games could be, the ones that were so bad you could barely ever beat them. I don't even know how many of my NES games I ever actually beat at any point as a child. Many I wouldn't beat until re-releases on, on stuff like the NES Classic. I even did a stream once trying to draw a map while I played Castlevania II, and I still had to look a few things up. As a kid, I had the Nintendo Power Guides to everything, but games were still absurdly hard even knowing what to do. In Final Fantasy I, there are two big sources of difficulty that make the original version hard to play. The first is that there aren't any save points in dungeons, so any deaths mean having to do the entire place over again. Coming from Final Fantasy IV, where it mostly gave you save points right before bosses, that was wild and extremely difficult. The second source, which goes along with the first to become an absolute nightmare, is that enemies frequently have normal attacks with a chance to paralyze poison or even instant kill on hit. 
In addition, they will appear in groups of random sizes. So you just have to have a random encounter with nine enemies and all of them have a chance to either kill you or, or paralyze you instantly. They attack, they go first. Uh, what could you possibly do? Even on emulated versions like the NES Classic, if you do a save state, you'll get the same encounter that plays out in the same way every time until something different happens, which means you can get soft locked if you would die and have to go back to the last point where you saved on the world map. Add these factors together and you have a game that is extremely hard to make progress in. For that reason, I never beat the game until nearly two decades after I first played it, when I could finally play a version that had save states. So with all of that working against it, is this game fun or even playable in the modern era? Yeah, I, I would say so. I quite enjoyed playing it again in the pandemic. Even emulated versions of the original, like the NES Classic, are so much fun that I've played through this game many times, trying out various weird party compositions. As a note on that, once you understand the game, you'll want to speed up the combat messages. Something I only had someone remind me to do fairly late in the stream when I did this for footage, and it was comically only possible after we died to reset it, and that was oddly hard to do at that point in the game. But anyway, the first Final Fantasy is basically second edition Dungeons & Dragons, right down to some designs changed for the US release for, I am sure, copyright reasons. But with a spell system that oddly previews fifth editions. So this is true right down to how much you just miss nonstop at the beginning. This tests your patience given how slow the combat is if you don't speed it up. You'll also miss a lot because you set everyone's commands at the start of a round, and if the target isn't alive anymore, the character just attacks nothing and misses. The magic system here doesn't use magic points like the other Final Fantasies after three. Instead, you have spell slots per level, like in modern Dungeons & Dragons. This causes some sadness with spell levels that have little or nothing useful and are basically wasted, while for others you can't take all the spells you want. This is a particularly big problem with Red Mages, which always seemed so appealing to me as a kid, but never quite seemed to work. In the original version, you also don't get ethers, so you can't regain spell slots except by camping outside of a dungeon. And even getting those spells is hard, because they're very expensive. Final Fantasy 1 was the first of the 1-6 through six bundle that I played in quarantine. I actually did this one on my iPhone, mostly just lying in bed, and I determined that the phone was too small for it compared to the iPad, which is why I played the later ones on the iPad instead. The iOS version was the Dawn of Souls version, which really changed too many things for my taste. Going to MP instead of spell slots was a reasonable change for gameplay, but at that point it's just not really Final Fantasy 1 anymore, at least that's how I felt about it. The biggest problem with this version is that I was too tempted to do the bonus dungeons, because I wanted to see the Final Fantasy VI bosses that were in them, but Boy, those dungeons were miserable. One of them had a room where every tile was either an encounter, in a game with such a high encounter rate that this was meant to be a clear punishment, or blocked by slow-moving NPCs you couldn't push. Those were the two most annoying things in the original game. It, yeah, all the bonus content was just so horrifyingly miserable. Because of the experience of playing this one, I didn't even look at the bonus content in Final Fantasy II since it was a similar remake. When the Pixel Remaster came out in Fall 2021, I thought that that was a much better version. If you want a version of Final Fantasy 1 that modern players could enjoy, that's the one to go with. And you can't buy the Dawn of Souls 1 on iOS anymore, only the Pixel Remaster. The Pixel Remaster cuts a balance of having autosaves and ethers, but not making you attack dead targets. The auto battle feature also speeds up combat enormously. I do lament that it looks a bit more like an early SNES game than an NES game, which is a criticism I have for all three of the NES game's Pixel Remasters, but it still looks great. After playing Final Fantasy XVI, I decided to replay the NES Classic Final Fantasy I for the contrast, and I enjoyed it a lot. When, when you know what you're doing and you don't lose an hour of progress in a dungeon to an AoE instant death spell, it is a very fun game. When done, I wouldn't have minded playing again with a different party composition. I instead, in fact, went to the Pixel Remaster again and just wanted to gauge the advances between the two versions. One of the things that that made clear was how much faster you level in the Pixel Remaster. In the original, I was level 26 at the final boss, while in the remaster, I was level 22 before the first of the four fiends, and level 44 by the end boss. And that's after doing the Peninsula of Power in the original and not being able to do it in the remaster because they took it out, which, by the way, is a tragedy. In prior versions of the game, they kept a map error that resulted in you encountering enemies meant for a different part of the map early on in a little peninsula. Those fights are really hard, but if you beat them, the rewards are so outsized for your level that it helps you power level past some of the intense early game difficulty. I also think it's more fun because, you know, normal level grinding is kind of monotonous, but these fights are hard enough to be interesting. As indicated by the leveling boost, it's also clearly less necessary in the Pixel Remaster. A long time ago, when I thought about doing this video, I was going to recommend that Final Fantasy 1 should only be played by hardcore Final Fantasy fans who really want to see the origin of the series, and then if you're going to do that, you should be playing the unaltered original. I don't think that anymore, since the Pixel Remaster, in addition to being more accessible to most players, maintains a lot of the real difficulty as opposed to the random number generator deaths, and shows you where the series started. 
I think anyone who enjoys Final Fantasy games should check it out because it's not a very long game. Fixed bugs also mean the spells actually work. In the original version, I think part of why I struggled as a kid was that I went with a suggested party composition of fighter, thief, white mage, black mage, and a lot of the thief's abilities didn't really work as far as I understand it. If you struggled with this game, I mean, just make two fighters, a black mage and a white mage, and, you know, the thief is just not pulling his weight quite as hard unless you're doing some very specific thing you know how to do. But fighters and monks, I just go with those. I've seen people stream this game without looking things up, and it turned out to be much more plausible than I would have initially guessed, at least while remaining fun. I don't know how much of this is due to the improved translation of the Pixel Remaster, since I will never know what it's like to start with this translation without already knowing everything. I wouldn't recommend anyone start playing Final Fantasy with the first one. I think 4 is a better place to start, and you can come back and play this one with a better grounding in series tropes from a game that explains them more clearly. And when you do, you might even like the higher difficulty of the first one. Final Fantasy 2. So much better than everyone is telling you. Final Fantasy II has an unjust reputation as a bad game. When I see streamers talking about going through older Final Fantasy games, people always pop in to say 2 and 3 are bad. With 2, it always comes back to the weird leveling system, and the idea that you level up by hitting yourself, and that's dumb. Well, I believe in the versions that I've played, the iOS version, which I think was based on the PSP version, and the Pixel Remaster, you don't even get skill ups for that now. Maybe you do, maybe you don't, but I did not spend time hitting myself while playing either version. It's just a meme, it's not a reflection of the game's quality, even if it is still true. I played Final Fantasy II for the first time in August of 2020, and at that point, you know, quarantine was really starting to get old. I'd played it on, I played it on my iPad, sitting alone in my bed in a windowless room, and it was still very enjoyable. I took a pause after a bit early on, just you know, go back and play Final Fantasy VI again, because I love Final Fantasy VI. But I came back to Final Fantasy II, and I found it a very rewarding experience. I played the Pixel Remaster when it came out in the fall of 2021, and then I replayed the Pixel Remaster for this footage in 2023, after finishing Final Fantasy XVI. None of these playthroughs were unpleasant. The aforementioned weird leveling system is just Skyrim. You level individual skills through use, just like you do in Skyrim. The difference is there's no overall character level up as you go. You know, every skill gains EXP as it's used, and then they level up on a scale of 1 to 16. That's it. That's the weird leveling system that everybody thinks is so impossibly inscrutable. It does have two weird quirks, though, one of which is that spells cost MP equal to their level, so raise actually becomes more expensive as it levels, and that's inconvenient. The other is that skills get harder to level up as the game goes, since you have to hit enemies more times in a fight or something like that in order to generate any EXP for them, and that's why sometimes you would hit yourself to make sure you could attack enough times. This system does get weird at higher levels, but you can also just ignore it and accept that you're only going to be leveling your weapons in harder fights, which is actually kind of fun because you get excited that this is a fight where you can get your skill ups in. There are some other awkward bits, like the Ultima spell being a huge plot point and then being utterly unusable in the actual game, unless you've been doing nothing but grinding spells. Getting some of the most important spell tomes, like Osmos, can also be annoying. And it's going to be really tough the first time you fight a boss whose defense is so high you can barely scratch it or maybe even do literally zero damage. The high defense can get old after a while before you find weapons that punch through it, like my beloved Ripper. Aside from that, I have almost exclusively positive things to say about this game. I think the hate comes from how inaccessible it was for so long. It wasn't released in the US for about a decade, and based on my experience with the FF5 version on PlayStation, I'm not surprised people would dislike the Dawn of Souls version, given that it was running on a very, very slow disc. I don't know if that's how it played out for Final Fantasy II, but I could see it. This game is such a leap over Final Fantasy 1. I. I don't know how much was updated from the Famicom version in terms of the interface. I've looked at some of it on YouTube, and it seems pretty similar, at least the, as far as the features that impressed me go. Playing it for the first time with updated music and graphics might bias me compared to Final Fantasy 1, but when you think about how bare bones the entire plot, dialogue, and everything in Final Fantasy 1 is, Final Fantasy 2 just adds so much more. It opens with an unwinnable fight that goes into a cutscene, something Final Fantasy 1 just didn't even try to do. It gives you terms to learn and repeat NPCs, which was a feature that astounded me for being on an NES game, given you can't even do that in most of the later ones. I don't think I saw anything like that again until a minigame in Final Fantasy XII where you repeat parts of stories to people on the streets. We also go from four unnamed generic characters to people with actual names and personalities, something Final Fantasy III backpedals on. We get our first Sid. He's tied to an airship. The story is a little generically rebellion against Empire, and it plays out in a very Star Wars fashion. In fact, it's one of the most comprehensible plots for any Final Fantasy game, and it does still manage to do a fun little twist near the end with a final boss that feels unique. This game also gives us our first Dragoon. It also gives us one of our first really amazing Final Zone music tracks in Pandemonium. There's not much that needs to be said about this particular game beyond that. As a side note on the versions, my understanding is that now that the Pixel Remasters are out, you can't get the PSP-based iOS version that I originally played, although I can still play my old one on my iPad. 
I don't think there's a big reason to want to play that version over the Pixel Remaster. The Remaster lacks some of the bonus content that was added later, but based on the bonus content in Final Fantasy 1, that is a good thing. The Pixel Remaster is a perfectly fine version. It's on Steam. It's accessible. You won't regret playing this one. It's not amazing compared to the later games, but it's good, solid Final Fantasy fun, and if you liked the Pixel era at all, you'll be glad you tried it. Final Fantasy 3. So, just like Final Fantasy 2 impressed me with the ability to learn and repeat terms, Final Fantasy 3 impressed me with the depth of its class system for an NES game. I mean, maybe I underestimate the NES, but these just feel like so much more than what the first game gave us. My first very confusing exposure to this game came when I, a child in love with Final Fantasy VI's music, wanted my mom to get the soundtrack for me. Of course, I told her Final Fantasy III, because that's how the game was labeled in North America, and for Christmas I received a strange CD with its text in Japanese, supposedly for Final Fantasy III's music, but instead it was this really weird uh, English language narration of the plot of Final Fantasy III, which I knew nothing about, followed by properly orchestrated music rather than the original soundtrack, and it had English language singing. It was bizarre, but kind of awesome, and it was called Final Fantasy III Legend of the Eternal Wind. I did also get the Final Fantasy VI OST from Japan, although I don't recall if it was the same Christmas. Shout out to my mom, who somehow imported music CDs with Japanese text in the 1990s. I first played Final Fantasy III's 3D remake on my iPad in September 2020. Like the second game, it wasn't originally released in the US. Unlike the second game, it got a 3D remake, which turns the generic characters you name into actual people with names and personalities. The Pixel Remaster undoes this, making it more like the original, which has some weird moments where characters sort of speak as a group and sort of as one individual. Like when you flirt with a with a, when you flirt with a princess, it's not really clear who's flirting. The plot is very stock Final Fantasy. There are crystals of elements, and they balance the world, and then they get out of whack, and then you play youths empowered by the crystals, and so on. The villain is not particularly memorable, but there are lots of fun characters along the way, and this game even introduces Moogles. 3 creates the job system that later gets advanced in Final Fantasy V, and I'd recommend playing 3 before 5 for that reason. It's not a long game, so the investment of doing it first isn't that major. I had played 5 first by about 20 years, but I think 3's job system would look better if, if it was the first thing that you saw. In both 3 and 5, I tend to just play the very basic normal white and black mages with standard melee backups, which makes the job system kind of pointless. You upgrade those classes to other versions over time, but it can make the whole mechanic feel unnecessary overall, compared to, say, just getting the job upgrade in Final Fantasy 1. The problem is that you get these very basic classes early, and you get used to those before you get the more advanced ones, and you don't want to bother to learn these new classes. The game does still force you to use certain jobs at certain points, there are a few annoying bits where you have to shrink your characters so you really can't be melee classes. There's a boss you have to be dragoons for. There's a boss where they explicitly tell you to be scholars, and so on. These are broadly not highlights, although I did like the scholar one. The cave where you have to be dark knights or the monsters multiply was so annoying that I just ran from everything the last time I played it. As an interesting note here, this game is somewhat infamous for its extremely long final dungeon. There is no save point in the final dungeon, but the autosave feature in newer versions makes this so much less stressful. I wasn't sure what would happen on the 3D remake if I died, though, so I just tried very hard not to. Like with 2, I thought that this one would really only be for hardcore fans of the series who, you know, who, who wanted to play everything, but having played the Pixel Remaster a few times and seen other people try it, I now also think this one is just enjoyable. You can still play the 3D remake, which is considered enough of a separate game that they didn't remove it from Steam. I don't know that it matters which version I recommend, though, since almost everyone will just be buying the bundle of the Pixel Remasters, and that's just the one that you're going to have. I think the 3D remake does have a lot of charm, though, and you should consider it. The bosses get to attack twice per round, which adds some interesting dynamics, as well as letting you get cheesed by them doing uh, several attacks in a row with powerful AoE spells. I think it was more challenging, and it does have an annoying mechanic where you have a penalty for switching jobs, so bear that in mind. But otherwise, I, again, if you like this version, and I think you probably will if you play through it, you should try the 3D remake. Final Fantasy IV, the best starting point. So, 4 is technically the first Final Fantasy I played, as I noted earlier, and while it was confusing to jump into the middle of the game when I was 8 years old and didn't understand what was going on in the Land of Summons or why I was taking damage on the floor, I think this game overall is the perfect starting point in the series for new players. It's probably the most basic game, the one you can just sit down and play, learning Final Fantasy mechanics as you go, without having to make decisions about your characters before you understand what you're doing or why you'd want to do it. That's because this is the only game in the series where you both don't choose your party at any point and don't determine anyone's development. Your party is always dictated for you by the plot, and characters level on one dimension. 
experience. You don't choose their classes or their spells. You do choose their equipment, but that's the entirety of the customization that you can have. I think that's actually a good thing for learning the series, and even though that makes it sound simplistic, it's still a ton of fun to replay, even as a veteran of the series. The original SNES North American version was much simplified on top of that, removing all the items you could use to cast spells like Blizzara, as well as making the game much easier. As an eight-year-old, I still had a lot of trouble with this because, well, I was eight years old and I did not know what I was doing. In 2020, for my first time playing the 3D remake version, I said it's a hard mode, and I did find that version genuinely pretty hard, although I was amused to see that the fights I found hard on that version were usually not to the same ones that I remembered being hard as a kid, like the Bagan fight. When I got the iOS bundle in June 2020, I initially skipped FF2 and FF3 because I just wanted to play this one again, especially in a version that was new to me. The 3D remake is a very faithful recreation of the room layouts from the original, which I was actually fairly surprised by. It has the voice talents of Sam Regal, Taliesin Jaffe, and Liam O'Brien, so I was definitely glad to have played it after getting into Critical Role. It adds a little more backstory to Golbez that I appreciated. It even has a nice touch related to this, where because the characters' names are spoken out loud, you can't change them. As a result, Naming Way goes through an identity crisis and keeps changing his job. The little quests that go along with that are fun, up until they want you to find one of the super rare drops, a little rainbow pudding. And I did that because, you know, it was quarantine. But that was definitely not a highlight of the game. I mean, a cool part... Uh, of the 3D version is that when you pause, you get to see what your current lead character is thinking about, which can have serious plot stuff or meta jokes about the game. The Pixel Remaster also does a great job. I haven't played the original in decades now, but it certainly feels true to it. I love the remastered music and everything about it looks and feels like it should. I played it when it was released in fall 2021 and again in July 2023 for the footage. I think this game hits all the right notes. It's my second favorite in the series, and nostalgia is clearly a big factor there, but other people I've seen play it for the first time with the Pixel Remaster have also enjoyed it. It has a solid, easy-to-follow story, one of those classic Final Fantasy collect the crystals before the evil empire gets them, but then things spin off the rails and get wild near the end plots. It has one device it massively overuses, though it would be a spoiler to say what that is. The characters are pretty memorable in a way no one from Final Fantasy II was, and of course I had one in three just had generic parties. I love that Kane was left-handed back when they used to make a point of characters randomly being left-handed. I myself am left-handed, and so is another very famous Final Fantasy character you might have heard of. As my first exposure to a Dragoon, I also found them to be a really neat idea. I was only able to beat Odin as a kid because Kane was in the air when he attacked. This game moves briskly, with side quests you can wander off and find, but not too many, and they come up late enough in the game that it doesn't hinder the pacing. The ending is also exactly what I'm looking for in an RPG like this, where it takes you around the world and shows you the results of your struggles. All in all, this is a top-tier Final Fantasy game and a perfect entry point for the series. It's surprisingly fun to replay, given that you know your runs aren't going to vary too much based on the lack of uh, ability to go off the rails. But if you like P the Pixel Remaster, definitely try the 3D version. However... Final Fantasy IV, The After Years. Just don't. So I love Final Fantasy IV, but I do not recommend ever playing the sequel. It is one of the only two Final Fantasy games I recommend you just don't play. You'll notice that I kept the Final Fantasy IV background here rather than dare to taint my desktop with exposure to the sequel. Because you'll play FF4 and you'll love it, and you'll think, oh, I want to see these characters again. How bad could this game be? And then you'll be sad. This game actually does do a good job with what you're looking for in a sequel. You get to see how everyone looks and what they're up to nearly two decades later, and the designs are pretty neat. What everyone's been up to is also neat. There's even a payoff for the part where Palom looks like he's hitting on Luca at the end of FF4. The problems start after that. The big things wrong with this game are the plot, which basically just rips off Chrono Trigger for some reason after a bit where the characters are all calling out how things are just like in the last game over and over while you get bored, and the gameplay, so basically the two big parts of a video game. But, you know, the music is still good. The gameplay is bad because this game was originally released, as I understand it, in a serialized form. It's structured as a series of ten stories that unlock as you finish them. And the real big problem is that each story shifts to different characters, so you don't have any development over the course of the game until the end. Instead, your reward for finishing a story is that you get your levels reset and you get to start off having to grind again for a little while before advancing in the new part. If, if you were playing these spread out over time, maybe that's not so bad when you play them back to back, it's so much more boring than it sounds. In addition, I played this, I mean, at least initially, because I needed a pause for it and I came back to it later, in July 2020 on my iPad, the day after finishing the FF4 3D remake. 
And that's bad because this game just blatantly uses the same levels as the original with a few exceptions. I had to take a break from this game and go back to it later because I just couldn't replay those. I kept having to fight through that damn water cave where you fight the Octomammoth over and over again. The nadir of this game is Edward's Tale, where I had to walk through it, turn around and walk through it again, and then back through it again. Well, at least the last time they give you a shortcut. But this is just tedious and boring and miserable, and I had already just fought through these places. When we get to the later sequels, like FF10-2 and FF13-2, we'll see reused NPC assets, and it'll feel a little weird in those, particularly 10-2, but never nearly so lazy and bad as it does here. Look, some of the ideas in this game are neat. Luca fighting with the Calcabrina dolls is cool, for example. Some of the areas aren't just the same dungeons from the first game, but the gameplay is sheer misery. Thankfully, you probably won't be exposed to it, because most people are going to buy the Pixel Remaster bundle, and this isn't in that because they didn't make a Pixel Remaster for it. So what I would recommend is, if you liked 4, just watch someone else play. And just skip past the parts where they're grinding levels and all the other boring parts and just see how the characters have evolved and, you know, who the new characters are. There's some interesting stuff in there, but there's no reason to actually play it. Final Fantasy V it wasn't a good fit for my personality. So Final Fantasy V is the first game where I think my opinion is likely to upset people because I'm just not a big fan of it. It's not bad, to be very clear. It just doesn't resonate with me. I would think this game would be huge for Final Fantasy XIV players, since you can see the origin of a lot of the jobs and classes, but as I've seen a few XIV players try five, none of them have seemed to be enjoying themselves all that much, and they, they don't even necessarily finish it. I also couldn't finish this the first time I tried to play it, which was on the PlayStation Anthology version that came out, I think, in 1999 or something like that. Because five wasn't originally released in the US, this was my first chance to play it, but the anthology version was not good. There's loading times, uh, every time you had to change the screen or go into a menu, or they, were, they weren't that long. I'm gonna complain a lot about the loading screens. They weren't that long, but after you've played six on a cartridge and there's no loading at all, even that little bit of interruption is really obnoxious. And I'm someone, this is where my personality comes in, I'm someone who obsessively checks and rechecks menus over and over again, and it's incredibly irritating to have this stall whenever you want to do that. Even 6 was a lot less fun with this when I played that on the PlayStation Anthology version. Even though it, that one did add a dash button that obviated the need for sprint shoes, which I appreciated, this is a factor that's really unfair to 5, this initial impression based on loading screens. I want to make clear that I'm aware of that. I don't remember how far I even got on that first run, but I don't think it was very far. I remember the ghost ship, which is pretty early, so it was somewhere after there. I wouldn't go back to beat it until playing an emulated version a decade later where I could just speed up the grinding and use the internet to look up everything I wanted to know, which was not as much of an option in 1999. I was reluctant to play it again when I got the 1-6 through six bundle on my iPad in June 2020, precisely because I knew that I would be grinding jobs too much. I'm just a little too obsessive not to try to grind out all of the jobs. I did get around to playing this one. It was one of the last ones that I did. I beat it in late October after playing all the other ones first. So why is this less gripping to me? Well, as with 3, you'll probably just end up wanting to stick to a few of the jobs and just move around those all the time. It has the same issue that the newer and weirder classes come later, so not only do you not know how... Uh, th those work compared to Black Mages, which you're intimately familiar with from all the prior games and even earlier in this game. But you've been playing this game for hours and hours, and it doesn't really explain what the new classes do when they pop up. I can't imagine playing this in the pre-internet era where you can't just look up what they do, what skills they unlock if you keep grinding and so on. I'm sure the manual would have just said that, like the Final Fantasy VI manual listed every spell, but I don't remember anything like that in the anthology menu, which, to be fair, I probably didn't read. So, you get your classic jobs, like Monk, White Mage, Blue Mage, now you're adding in Berserkers, Mystic Knights, Time Mages, Mimes, Geomancers, Beastmasters, Rangers, Samurai, Chemists, and so on. And that's before the advanced version adds the Necromancer, the Cannoneer, the Gladiator, and the Oracle. I didn't even remember some of these until I looked them up while writing this script. So that gives the game immense replay value, yeah, but I've never played it again back to back, so I always find myself not remembering the new weird classes and just defaulting to the basic ones. How different is this game from when we only had the same class selection from Final Fantasy 1? Swap the red mage from the second crystal with the blue mage from the first, and it's just the first set of jobs from Final Fantasy 1 right at the beginning. In practice, you do switch jobs around a bit, but it makes it feel like you're playing inefficiently just to try the new jobs. Mechanically, as you level in a job, it lets you move abilities from that job to other jobs, which is a good design, because it means after you've played a job long enough, you have an incentive to try another job without losing what you've just leveled. But actually maxing out a job takes ages and ages and ages. 
And that's why I don't find five a good fit for my personality. I am much too obsessive about wanting to finish leveling a job before moving on to another one. And that's just not practical with a lot of these. They max out at different rates, and unsurprisingly, some of the most powerful ones, like the Red Mage Ultimate ability, take forever to grind. So the game encourages a degree of grinding that makes it less fun for me personally. I was reluctant to play the Pixel Remaster for that specific reason, but in the end, when I did, I had a fine time when I played it in November 2021. This is also one of the old, some of the oldest Final Fantasy footage that I kept, because this was the first game where I actually started saving the footage uh, after it had gone on Twitch before learning I could just hit record separately in OBS. Because of the flexibility and party composition in this game, I completely get why people who go deep on this game love it so much. But whenever I think of playing it, I just feel overwhelmed by the amount of grinding and class management that I have to deal with. And this game introduces the super bosses with Omega Weapon and Shinryu, but they're so out of scale to where you are in a normal run that I felt like I'd have to grind an eternity beyond anything else in the game just to fight them, and it never seemed worth it. Unlike Omega Weapon and FF8, where I was able to do it with an average party level of 26. The characters also just didn't resonate with me very much. Lena feels pretty generic, and the main character is a doofus named Butts in the original translation. Ferris I liked, and Gallif is extremely entertaining and endearing, but they didn't stick with me like a lot of characters from 4 and 6. The plot also feels very much like just Three's plot all over again, with crystals of elements affecting the world and a villain who wants a big void area of darkness or something like that. However, I want to end this one on a very high note by talking about how this game introduces Gilgamesh and the Battle on the Bridge theme that has gone on to be associated with our dear Greg. And boy does the Pixel Remaster go hard on the reorchestration of this version. It is fantastic, and I was so happy. The, the Pixel Remaster is a great version of this game. Play it and have fun. Just don't stress too much about the job grinding, and unless you really love blind runs, you should just look up what the jobs do, so you can plan ahead. Final Fantasy VI, the greatest game of all time. So I'm going to have to start by noting just how biased I am with this game. I played it first when I was 10, and it was brand new, and that's just not a fair comparison for the other games to have to go up against. 4 is the only one that can compete on that axis, notably one that I also played as a small child. I can still picture when I saw it at the Babbage's store in the Belden Village Mall in Ohio, not expecting it to even be out yet, and begging my dad to get it for me despite the fact that it had a then-absurd $80 price sticker, which is closer to twice that in 2024 money. This was the first Final Fantasy that I had to wait to get released. And boy, that starting segment with the Magitek suits walking while the credits played and Terra's theme rolled. My impatient 10-year-old self did think, okay, this is going on for a little while, but just as 13-year-old me would think that Final Fantasy VII's opening a few years later was a little slow. But this was just what I had been waiting for. I really wish my 10-year-old Star Wars-obsessed self could have known that Vix and Wedge were intended to be Biggs and Wedge NBA Star Wars reference, but can't have everything. There were a few things I started to dislike early on. I didn't like that the technology advanced enough to have trains and guns, even if logically these things had clear antecedents in earlier games, but they were common inventions here, not relics in ancient towers. I didn't know the term steampunk at the time, or anything else about that aesthetic, so I didn't quite get what the game was doing with that technology level. I like it more as an adult than I do then, and it, it did grow on me at the time. I was also put off by dropping the five party members from Final Fantasy IV down to the four party members here. I didn't know that was actually the standard in Final Fantasy games to that point, and Final Fantasy IV was the deviation. You really feel that party limit a lot in this game, since it has the largest cast of any of the main games at 14 recruitable party members. As a result, I remember at least one moment I declared to my sister I hated the game, but I moved past that and I was already in love with it long before the end. If I remember correctly, at the time I was frustrated around the first real Kefka fight and the game won me over not long after that. Despite it being the greatest video game ever made, it does have some flaws. Edgar has not aged well, and it was a creeping horror each time I read a new translation of his interaction with the realm. Uh, having some of the uncensored scripts makes him seem even worse than Zidane, which is saying something. The Pixel Remaster tones some of those translations back down again, but yeah. His character was actually written by a woman, if that gives it any context, but I don't know that it makes me feel better or worse. Characters also get homogenized just after you get espers. Magic is so powerful that on your first run you'll probably just be spamming some of the most powerful spells, and maybe using a blitz or two, so mechanically most of the characters are going to feel the same most of the time. In my first play, I used Mog, Gogo, Umaro, and Edgar as my main party, so it didn't always play out like that, but I, was, I wasn't just spam, spamming dual-cast Ultimas for the most part. And the spells led to the other issue, which is the grindy nature of learning them. It's cumbersome to manage who is on which Esper and learning what. More recent remakes helpfully give you a star when someone has finished an Esper, but 
by the time I played remakes that I did, I was also aware you're supposed to be switching espers around when you level up for training. That means needing to micromanage when someone is about to level and switching them to the right esper for just that fight, and it sucks if they level one fight earlier than you expected and you lose out on the plus two magic bonus from zone seek. I kind of wish I'd never learned the importance of training with espers because it's just a hassle. And even without that, espers do encourage an absurd amount of boring grinding. This is the first game I can recall where I spent a vast amount of time grinding. In Final Fantasy IV, I, I did a little to get rid of Meteor, and I had one brief part where I was underleveled from running away too much, but it wasn't nearly as bad as trying to teach half a dozen characters Ultima when you can only do one character at a time and it levels very slowly. And you need to level more than just the four characters you want to play because the game has many parts where the party gets split and you have to switch between multiple groups. This is particularly punishing in the final dungeon where you need to use 12 of the 14 characters. In the Game Boy Advance version, the bonus dungeon also does this and it is a pain as a result. Later versions have fixed this, but the SNES version is also incredibly buggy. Famously, if you cast invisibility on an enemy, its magic resist drops to zero and you can use an instant death spell on it. As a 10-year-old, I didn't realize what was happening, and since I used X-Zone, now called Banish, to do it, I thought it was because they weren't visually on the screen anymore. Also, due to a bug with Evade, the game uses your Magic Evade stat instead for both physical and Magic Evasion. This means darkness effects and Evade boosts do nothing, and the Force Shield that is meant to be weak physical protection and high magic protection is actually absurdly powerful. Again, as a child, I didn't realize all of this was being caused by a bug, I just noticed people with that shield never seemed to get hit. There are also too many random encounters, and it's far too easy to miss the Moogle charm to turn them off. There's a lack of direction in the second half. I actually thought this was wonderful as a child with tons of time to spend on exploring it, but I've seen streamers get lost and frustrated with it. But most of those aren't going to hinder you very much, as on your first playthrough you won't know about Esper training. You might just play the character abilities you like instead of spamming the most powerful spells. I certainly had fun as a kid making Mog Dance, even though it was a terrible, terrible idea strategically. You'll be bothered by the random encounter rate while running around trying to find the answer to a puzzle. But I always just rush straight to the Moogle charm as soon as it's available and Mog just stays in the party. So what does this game do right that makes it my favorite game of all time? When it comes to loving a Final Fantasy game, it certainly helps if the mechanics are clean and fun, but for me the sheer feelings caused by the story and the characters are what stick with me. This is what I'm hoping to eventually get out of 14 when I finish the MSQ there, since the mechanics there are really not holding up their end of it. But if it gives me a moment as brilliant as Kefka destroying the world or Celis on the cliff with fantastic music to boot, well then I'll adore it. The big theme of this game is recovering from loss. Almost all the party members have lost one or more loved ones and their journey is about finding a purpose in a world that took everything from them. This is pretty heavy for a 10 year old, but I didn't have the context to appreciate it. Of course, the bodlerized as a translation for the SNES successfully disguised exactly what was happening on that cliff and I didn't get it because again, I was 10. And some of that loss is my fault. The fact that two major characters only die if you screw up, well, it's unclear enough that you've done something wrong and you probably will screw up. That was perfect. On your first play, you're, you'll almost assuredly have Sid die and get the most moving scene in the game, but on your second run, you can save him. These days, chat usually warns people not to let Shadow die, but as the cool ninja, he was my favorite character as a kid, and it was devastating to find out after the game that it was my fault he died. And the themes hit differently as I get close to 40 years old than they did when I was 10 years old. I understand more about loss myself and what it is that makes you keep going despite it. Kefka is also my personal favorite villain in the series or any video game. I know Sephiroth is a much bigger popular success, and later representations of Kefka make him maybe just a little too close to just being the Joker, but he's the perfect antagonist for this game. First off, at the halfway point of the game, he pulls off exactly what Sephiroth never manages to accomplish, creating a cataclysm in order to absorb enough power to become a god. You fight him many times over the game, and that laugh, it was such an unusual thing to have voiced in a game back then, popping up out of nowhere to make you groan at what's about to happen. You also fight him repeatedly, rather than him appearing out of nowhere like Zemus or Necron, or being a known quantity but not getting involved with you like Vayne. It builds up your hatred towards him, and you know when you hear that laugh you're about to hate him even more. I was so pleased when Nintendo Power named him the Villain of the Year, and I was far too emotionally invested in waiting for that issue to arrive because I was worried they were just going to give everything to Donkey Kong Country, which is a true classic but has not been as much of a cultural factor in a quarter of a century as Final Fantasy VI has been. They also gave it best music. The music in this game is just so evocative. It's great in all the FF games, but in my personal opinion, this is the height. As a child, my mom knew I wanted the soundtrack so much she imported it from Japan, which is why my imported iTunes tracks are still in Japanese. I think Terra's theme, used as the overworld theme, is just a perfect going-on-a-quest theme. 
The Overworld themes started getting kind of boring with 7, 8, and 9 before Overworld just disappeared entirely with 10. Even the combat screen does a great job of looking like you're off on a journey in the wilderness. Look at that lake and that mountain in the background. I adored this as a kid, and when I've recently taken up uh, trying to relearn the piano, Terra's theme is one of the first things I tried to learn. I replayed this game a lot on my SNES, and I have gobbled up every re-release that I can. I bought the PS1 Anthology version, which also came with FF5. As I've mentioned before, it had annoying load times on all of the menus being on a CD, but I did love the FMV sequences and that it came with a little CD with some of the music for both it and FF5. When the GBA version came out, I of course played it, doing the new content like the additional Espers and the Dragon's Den, although I didn't bother to do the entire gauntlet for the crown because I wanted to do it when I would have time to steal elixirs from all of the pots and then leave and come back. I, look, I liked hoarding. In 2020, since I bought the bundle of Final Fantasy 1 through 6, I played the iOS version on my iPad. The updated character sprites really drove me crazy, but I do want to say that I liked the graphical improvements to the backgrounds. I liked the character portraits while people were talking, and I'm sad they removed those later. I liked the new translation. But boy, those sprites just fell wrong. I have a lot of nostalgia for this game, so the quality of the art is less relevant than whether it feels right or wrong, and those sprites felt wrong. That said, I winced when I would see a streamer, especially after playing the original FF7, go back to FF6, and then have endless people in chat whine about the graphics. It clearly hurt a lot of streamers' experience with the game, and it's just not necessary to whine in someone else's chat. I suppose everyone thinks they're mentioning it briefly, but when it happens all the time, it can get frustrating. I'm glad this wasn't the version I streamed. I did get that crown, by the way, uh, but doing the Dragon's Den again reminded me of how miserable it was as bonus content, making you split parties again and deal with so many random encounters while exploring. Still, the iOS version is kind of fine aside from the graphics, and I like the changes to Bushido. I wish they'd kept the character portraits around during dialogue for the Pixel Remaster. A little later in 2020, I, I, I finally got a capture card, and the, the first thing that I tried to stream uh, was, in fact, Final Fantasy VI on my SNES Classic. That's where the footage of it here comes from. I then played it again when the Pixel Remaster came out in February 2022, this time all dressed up and with champagne to celebrate the release. It had gotten delayed over and over again, and I was sad with every delay, but happy that they put the time in that the game needed. Edgar and Kefka do still look a little wrong to me in this version, and I'm sad we lost the character portraits, as I said, but everything else is fantastic, and I love the new opera scene, with proper singing. The German translation in particular is my favorite, since it sounds the most operatic, where many of the others are leaning into the fact that, correct for the stories, Celeste is not a professional opera singer. The entire new soundtrack is a delight, although for some reason, no version of Searching for Friends, my favorite track in the entire game, has ever felt quite right to me compared to the original one. I could go on endlessly about this game, so I'll just stop here. But if you're thinking of playing it now, the Pixel Remaster is the obvious choice, and the game finally has a definitive version that I can easily recommend. If you have access to an SNES classic, I do also recommend playing the original version. Final Fantasy VII, the one that made me leave the series. Okay, I already talked about how my initial experience playing this game wasn't great. I'll elaborate with a few extra details now, and we're gonna do it over footage playing the snowboarding minigame because I have a lot of resentment towards that part. As a 13 year old, I had hit the age of really disliking it when people were trying too hard to be cool. And boy, compared to other Final Fantasy games, this one tries very hard to be cool. I can't imagine a more perfect avatar of look how cool I am than Sephiroth's design. Except maybe everyone in the first Matrix movie, which came out a couple years later, which I also didn't like. Also, when I have some resentment towards this game, bear in mind that I had a choice of two video games that I could get, which released within a few weeks of each other in the US. Final Fantasy VII came out in early September, and GoldenEye 007 came out two weeks before that. I had a choice of getting GoldenEye or Final Fantasy, and I went with Final Fantasy VII, because of course I was going to, and then I didn't love it, and I had to wait much longer to get GoldenEye, which I loved instantly and enormously when I rented it, and I held that against the PlayStation game. Final Fantasy VII was off-putting to me for more than just the aesthetics. First, this game has a lot of minigames. I hate minigames. They can be good when implemented well, I'm, I'm gonna praise FF8 for Triple Triad, but I have two big rules for them. First, don't make me play it, and second, if you do make me play it, don't make me win at it. If I hate the minigame, I don't want to have to get stuck playing it for a moment longer than necessary. If it's important to you as a designer that I see the minigame you put so much work into, I get it. You can, if you must, make me play one round of it. But don't make me have to win at it. FF8 never requires you to play, let alone win Triple Triad, while FF9 forces you to play Tetra Master, and you have to win at least a few games of it. But no Final Fantasy comes anywhere near Final Fantasy VII for the number of intrusive, disruptive, and unfun minigames. 
That's why I'm showing this bizarre moment from the game. This is the snowboarding section. This is just after one of the most emotional, famous, dramatic moments in video game history. We need catharsis, and instead we get this. It's a snowboarding scene. It should be completely cool, radical, hip, whatever the Matrix-loving kids these days say. And instead, it's extremely slow-moving. Everything grinds to a halt when you hit any bumps. And most bizarrely of all, it has no music. Did, did they think we'd love it too much for the music? Because it was already extreme enough? I, I, I kind of regret that when I recorded this, it went well enough that it wasn't just me bumping into trees nonstop like it was in the 90s. And speaking of recording, this is the only game other than After Years that I didn't record myself playing in its entirety. This is why we're not also watching the equally miserable submarine video game or God help me the Chocobo Racing. I went back in 2023 to record a couple segments of it, the beginning, that famous moment, Sid's absolute awfulness, the snowboarding, and the ending. That's most of what I wanted to talk about anyway. On the topic of minigames, the fact that the most powerful spell in the game one basically necessary to beat the super bosses without weird gimmicks is gated behind chocobo racing for hours and hours and hours, followed by restarting your game until you get the right color chocobos. I never even tried to get Knights of the Round when I first played the game. I only finally got it in 2020 when the remake made me decide it was time to give Final Fantasy VII another try. I'm very curious to see what the remake does with Sid, by the way, because he is just awful. He is easily the worst Sid in a Final Fantasy game. Sure, most of the others are war criminals, but they're usually nice, or at least misguided war criminals. This one's just emotionally abusive to a woman. Even when he learns his lesson later, it's not really a lesson about not being a horrible person. He was just wrong about the reason he was being horrible. I have to imagine Sid will be getting a fairly sizable reconfiguring to be in a game releasing in the 2020s. And part one of the remake gave the other characters so much life that I was able to transfer that back to the original, and then I liked them a lot more when I replayed it in 2020. Plus, on my first play in the 90s, I missed the opt optional missable cutscene that completely explains Cloud's backstory. Only while watching people play the remake and googling the plot to understand it did I finally learn what really happened to Cloud. And Cloud's story is a good story. I think Cloud is an S-tier protagonist with his entire background. But in my first run, he seemed to just be making up multiple contradictory memories and it didn't ever explain what they meant by calling him a clone. His actual life is really tragic and really moving, and his growth over the course of the game is a fantastic arc. I wonder how differently I'd have felt about this game if they hadn't hidden the truth in a place I had no reason to go back to. I might say Cloud is the only S-tier Final Fantasy protagonist, at least maybe before 16. I love Terra, but she isn't given as much to do, especially in the second half of her game. The S-tier version of Cloud is the one you see by the end, where he isn't the arrogant, less friendly one of the early game that I found so off-putting at first. His arc is really important, and I think it's a longer and better arc than any other Final Fantasy protagonist, all contained within a single game. Unfortunately, a lot of his appearances elsewhere, like Kingdom Hearts, are a bit more mid-game or early-game Cloud than late-game Cloud, at least in my opinion. And of course, the elephant character in the room, Sephiroth, feels like he was grown in a lab to try to be cool. Which, you know, is basically what Hojo did. I will concede, though, that he is also pretty interesting, especially when Genova's full background is explained. I do think he's a great character and a great villain, and I'm not just saying that because he, like me, is left-handed and we need all the representation we can get after Link was brutally retconned in the era where we were swinging controllers. But Sephiroth never quite clicked with me. I came away from my 2020 replay much more impressed with Cloud than with Sephiroth. And I will say, when I replayed it in 2020, I did really enjoy this game. The things I'm complaining about here were all still real problems, but the remake, which we'll discuss later, really changed my perspective. So to talk about my 2020 experience, I played it in April 2020, when it was just setting in that quarantine was in fact going to last a while. I played it on my PS Classic, which let me play the original version without having to deal with any of the loading times that so annoyed me with the original. The Mako flakes that look like snow at the beginning felt like this interminable wait after, after already loading so much when I was 13. But now I can watch them and just enjoy the scenes and appreciate how well the remake captured this opening. I don't remember if this game got me again with the infamous attack while its tail is up line, but, you know, here I am not falling for it three years after that. For this run, unlike in 1997, I had the full powers of the internet and walkthroughs to make sure I didn't miss anything. I think I had some kind of game pro style guide as a kid to get Yuffie, but I cannot imagine navigating that dialogue blind. I've seen people do it and it seems miserable, especially if reloading requires all of that loading on a CD-based system. Loading that made even Final Fantasy VI less fun for me. 
This time I made those chocobos do unspeakable things until I got the gold chocobo, and gosh darn, I did beat both weapons. I don't have footage of that, okay? So instead we're just watching how the Knights of the Round's unskippable animation takes forever. About 10 minutes of the 12 or so minute fight against Emerald Weapon was just watching this animation over and over again. But that came near the end. And it at least felt like an accomplishment, even if the fight itself was boring. And I already knew the paralyzed trick with Ruby, so that fight was actually pretty easy. One of the best things I can say about how it felt, sitting alone in my room playing this game again, is that it made me immediately want to get Final Fantasy IX and play that too. The hooks were back in me. I'm not sure I would ever have enjoyed this on the original PS1, but it definitely brought me comfort in a really weird and difficult time for the whole world. Final Fantasy VII Remake. This is the game that got me back into the series. So, as I noted at the beginning, everyone was playing this in early quarantine, and even though I had no intention of playing it myself, I watched people streaming it because quarantine. Uh, now, this was the first game that I really just watched people play on Twitch that wasn't Magic the Gathering or a Critical Role. So it was the game that showed me that it could be fun to just watch people play narrative games. And that led me to then watch other people play the original Final Fantasy VII after they finished this one. And then I would watch people streaming, you know, other games because it's really entertaining and it doesn't require much focus. So you can do it while working on, say, the crossword puzzle, which was another hobby that I picked up in quarantine. And given my antagonistic history with Final Fantasy VII, I wasn't looking forward to hearing there was going to be a big budget remake, that everyone was just going to fawn over and be more impressed with Final Fantasy VII. But when I watched people play it, it looked really good. And it did do a good job of showing the softer bits of Cloud and Barrett early, so while they still come off as jerks at first, they aren't quite as one-dimensionally so for a while. I would single out Barrett's voice actor especially for making me just love his performance and turning my opinion of the character around. I never even liked Aerith in the original version, and so I cared less about certain famous events in this game. But here, absolutely wonderful performance. I was won over before she and Cloud were even done escaping the immediate vicinity of the church. In fact, one of the flaws in the game is that it made me care too much about characters whose stories really couldn't go anywhere, absent some perhaps now anticipated changes to the storyline. I still didn't want to play this one myself too much, because when I saw people streaming it, it looked like every bad guy was a bullet sponge. Now, I'd played Skyrim on the hardest settings uh, at the very beginning of quarantine, and I found that after the beginning was a little difficult, it just became tedious, because every enemy had so many hit points. It wasn't hard to win after the world opened up, it just took forever. And the game looked like it was similar to that grind from watching people play. The Sorterpede boss, in particular, seemed to be taking people ages to beat because it took so little damage. Now, the whole thing just seemed unappealing to me as a game, even though the cutscenes were fantastic. But when I played it, I learned that, well, the people I saw streaming it at first, you know, they hadn't played every earlier Final Fantasy, and they weren't perhaps as familiar with all of the enemy weaknesses. It even seemed as though people who came over from 14 were at a disadvantage because that game handles weaknesses differently, which I do think is a good decision for an MMO. I mean, I remember when everyone had to be a Frost Mage in Molten Core because everything was immune to fire and Arcane wasn't even a functional talent tree. Also, by the time I played it in mid-2023, I had, I had seen it played so many times that I knew all of the tricks. Like, I knew you were supposed to use, use Braver against that one boss when the scan was coy about which one you're supposed to use. So, when I got to the Sorterpede boss and I saw you're just supposed to use magic, I just did that and it died really quickly. In fact, very little of this game felt tedious. The biggest grind was Materia Sorting, which was true to the original and is quite common across Final Fantasy games. It was also a little cumbersome upgrading and keeping track of weapons, but I did like that this meant every weapon had some utility, even late in the game. The Final Fantasy IX style system of learning, you know, mo learning moves permanently from one item, and that's something I've already said I'm a big fan of. So it felt a little cumbersome switching between characters as well, and I really preferred to just focus on one. Tifa and Cloud had the most fun fighting styles. I particularly liked how Cloud finally made use of his ridiculously large sword to block. And the blocking mechanics, which, you know, I, I would end up missing in Final Fantasy XVI, played really well, and I enjoyed the combat a lot. Spells felt a bit like they slowed things down, like in Secret of Mana, where the game would pause for you to cast spells, and as I mentioned in Final Fantasy XII. But the controller shortcuts, once I started using them, were great. The final fight against Sephiroth was exactly what I was hoping for, a good sword fight with lots of blocking. Story-wise, I absolutely adored how it was aware it was a remake, and wasn't just a retread, but in some way a sequel to the original. I'm really curious where they go with this, but the whole idea of the Arbiters of Fate nagging them to keep the original story felt delightfully meta for the task the creators had of remaking one of the most beloved games of all time. 
And they even updated some of the material from the original that hadn't aged quite as well. You know, a transphobic scene turns into a fantastic dance minigame with that much more modern commentary on it. Tiva doesn't use any dated offensive language when climbing the stairs. And the stairs scene, by the way, perfect. Absolutely perfect. I almost have less to say about this one than some of the others because there really aren't many flaws to pick at. If I hadn't gone in expecting combat to be slower, I, you know, I might have thought it would be slow, but it was still faster than I expected, so I was happy. They even did a great job translating some of the insane enemy designs, like the fan guys from the original. I also played the intermission with Yuffie, and that was surprisingly good, mostly because I just, I just didn't do the minigame more than once. You know, it created wholly new characters, it made me care, and then it made me sad, while also bringing out characters from other Final Fantasy VII properties that I hadn't even played. The after credits bit, which I wasn't expecting, was exactly what I was hoping for with Zack. So this one is top tier Final Fantasy and a huge triumph. This is definitely one of the ones you can start off playing if you haven't played anything in the series. Final Fantasy VIII. I really really loved this one. Final Fantasy VIII has a poor reputation amongst probably most fans of the series. There's a sort of maligned subclass of 2, 3, 8, and the 13 trilogy where people seem to have just heard a lot of bad things about them. I can't speak to the original experiences of playing those games, but I had a great time with all of them in their remastered versions, and I recommend people play them. And FF8 in particular was just a phenomenal experience for me. I played it in June 2020, right after FF9, and it just hit perfectly. This was a little bit before my birthday in the pandemic, which I knew I'd be spending alone, and just after the point when quarantine was really starting to bother me. I didn't have a rough time overall with quarantine, as it gave me plenty of time to just read books and play games, and I don't mind being alone for long periods of time, but around June, it was getting pretty old. And this game was such a bright spot for me then. I enjoyed the mechanics, I enjoyed the look and the feel, I think it's an interesting story with a really moving ending. In fact, I think this is a case of a game where the ending massively elevated it for me. I think the last shot of the ending was perfect and it gave me everything I wanted in wrapping up the game. We'll get to another Final Fantasy much later where the ending really hurt my opinion of the game, but I would rank this in the top three endings with 6 and 10. It just gave me the feels in a way I wasn't expecting, with the visuals and the music hitting just right. You even get a payoff for the hot dogs. That said, it's not hard to know why this game is polarizing. After all, I didn't even want to try it when it came out after seeing it had a modern and futuristic setting. This game is, is the closest to just looking like the 20th century of any Final Fantasy except maybe 15. But that's not why people object to it. The main source of criticism is the junction system. This is the game's ability system, and it is... it's involved. I hesitate to say it's complicated, because it both is and isn't. In fact, watching other people play this game made me irritated at the mega fans in chat who over and over again would tell a streamer, it's not that complicated. But it is complicated. It just looks more complicated than it is. On the other hand, telling someone who's struggling with a complicated system that it's not complicated and you did it just fine when you were 10 years old, well, who wants to hear that? I think this game suffers from people who know it well being frustrated with people who are still learning it. The too long didn't read on the junction system, if you're struggling with this game, is to just use the auto setting. It'll assign your junctions pretty well. That suffices for 90% of the game, and the only thing you really need to watch out for is when it assigns elemental affinities to weapons and you face a boss that absorbs that element. And you also want to prioritize speed and accuracy against cactuars, but if you're playing Final Fantasy, you already knew that. After doing my replay, I watched streamers try and play it, and a lot of them weren't enjoying it. And you know what? It was a lot more frustrating to watch people play than I thought it would be. I think Part of the problem is people hear that using the auto setting for junctions is bad, so people who aren't intimately familiar with the game feel the need to slog through micromanaging everything. And the other half of the junction system feels like a huge slog, drawing spells. In this game, instead of grinding ability points, you basically use spells you've gathered, assigning them to certain abilities. Do you want your HP to go higher? Junction a powerful spell you have 100 copies of. Only some spells junction better with HP, some junction better with speed, and some grant status effects or elemental affinities. It's a neat system, because it lets you customize yourself for specific situations. As I said, most of the time, auto is just fine. But if you're facing fire enemies, you can set it to absorb fire, or as the game shows you how to do early on, you can make it so your attacks inflict sleep on powerful enemies. And amazingly, the game lets you do that! Instead of the attacks that inflict sleep waking it up, they stay asleep! It even lets you transfer fully prepared junctions, that when you have to swap parties, you don't have that one person who's lagging behind every, everyone by so much that it's miserable. There is one problem with this system, which is that it frequently accidentally takes some junctions apart when you get to the Laguna segments, but otherwise it's very convenient. The problem is, you draw spells from draw points or from enemies, often in the range of 3 to 8 at a time. 
it takes a while to get three characters maxed out on 100 copies of a spell, meaning that any combat with an enemy that has a new spell is going to be incredibly boring until you hit the cap. On my first run, I did exactly that, and now I know that that's not what you really want to be doing. Sitting there and drawing 100 copies of every spell whenever you see it for the first time, and then never casting those spells so your junctions can be bigger isn't very fun. The game gives you a bad incentive by making it so that casting spells, which come from your stock of the spell one at a time, no MP in this game, makes you weaker, so you just don't cast them. What I understood on my second run is that instead of wasting time doing this, you can get some of the most powerful spells in the game in very large numbers very quickly by turning enemies into cards, and then turning the cards into items, and items into spells, and then junctioning the spells. See, it's not that complicated. It's hard to explain, but after you do it a few times, it makes perfect sense, and the game becomes quite smooth. You can even stock up on very powerful tornado spells very early in the game by playing Triple Triad, making you feel very overpowered before you leave on the first mission after graduation. And the other great thing about turning the bad guys into cards is that they don't give you EXP when they do that. Because unlike other Final Fantasies, in this game, enemies and bosses scale with your level. But they don't scale with what you have junctions. So if you play card games to get cards, you turn into items, you turn into powerful spells, and then junction into those spells, you can be low-level facing low-level enemies, but hit like a high-level character. What part of that is somehow counterintuitive to you? Why didn't you instantly get that the moment you picked up the game and never need anyone to explain it? Anyway. It's easy to stay at a low level because bosses don't give EXP, as is the case in many Final Fantasy games. And very near the beginning of the game, you're given a Guardian Force who lets you turn off random encounters without using a cheat, something I believe every Final Fantasy game should make available in some form at some time. Random encounters are good when you're first going through a dungeon, but when you've fought all the types of enemies there and you're just wandering around in circles with a puzzle, it's miserable. Watching other people stream the, the earlier games in the series, it's noticeable just how often one of the big complaints is the random encounter frequency. And returning to complaints people have, Final Fantasy VIII really raises some interesting questions about what it means to play a game wrong. In a single-player game, the only way to play it wrong is if you're not enjoying it. But by that criterion, most of the streamers I saw play it did in fact play it wrong. It's rough watching somebody play a game you love and not be enjoying it, and railing at the game and saying it's a bad game or a badly designed game, and they don't want to play it anymore, but they could play it in a way that's slightly more fun. I think if you're playing a game and you're not having fun, it's probably best to ask chat if there's a more fun way to play it, and then at least try that. I think people frequently want no hints and no tips and no backseating to too high a degree, especially if it's explaining the interface. But chat also needs to be tactful in its suggestions and understanding of when it is and is not okay to backseat. I would see some people play this game, and they weren't having fun, but they were winning. And so when someone would say they were doing it wrong, they would say they were doing it right because they were winning. But they were doing it in a way that wasn't fun, and I think if you're playing the game in a way that isn't fun but does let you win, that's the closest it can come to playing it wrong. There is the further question of what the game tells you to do. On the surface, this game tells you to play it in a way that won't be very fun. To sit there drawing spells but never casting them, to micromanage your junctions, and so on. It has a very interesting tutorial in the form of an exam that quizzes you on the game's mechanics. I personally really like this, but that might say a little bit more about me and what I was like as a student. But this ends up being a solid income source once you get your seed rank. But literally giving the player an exam on game mechanics is not going to appeal to everyone. The one part of the mechanics people seem to like consistently, and it's how I played the game the first time, is to spam summons. The summons in this game are called Guardian Forces, which the game always calls GFs, and as a result, they are known nearly universally as Squall's girlfriends. When I first heard that term used, I honestly thought I was being told that Squall really did have women who were giving him powers. In this game, since there's no MP, you can cast a summon as long as it has HP, and that HP goes down as you get hit while it's being summoned. This can provide a nice damage buffer at key moments, as well as letting you do something big and cool on a regular basis. And on the Switch version, you can speed up through the summoning animations. The Switch Remaster makes this incredibly quick and easy, since it's a single tap of the thumbstick to make things go at three times speed, and to turn potentially tedious parts like animations or drawing spells more bearable. You also gain other abilities by leveling your girlfriends. Unfortunately, I missed the very first missable girlfriend right at the beginning. In reaction to using a guide too much in Final Fantasy IX, I hurt myself by not drawing Siren from the first boss, which means I was without it for, well, the entire game until the final dungeon. This is because before, if it had ever said something was new, it was a bunch of question marks. And since it said Siren, I assumed it was some spell or something that I already had. After that, I would take a look at guides from time to time, but much less than in 9, and I did think that made it more fun. In general, I like to solve puzzles, but I don't like to waste my time on something if I don't think it's supposed to be a puzzle. I've seen streamers who will stubbornly refuse to look up where to go for an hour because they missed a line of dialogue telling them where to go, and since this is a fun thing for me and not an income stream, I cannot devote that kind of time to it.
I think this might be the best limit break system of any Final Fantasy game. It's extremely exploitable, but it adds tension and fun. Basically, your limit break has a chance to pop up whenever you're at low health or have status ailments, and that chance goes up the more dire your situation. So you can try to keep yourself just barely alive to keep triggering it. You can even reroll by passing your turn over and over until it pops up, but all this takes time, and you put yourself at risk of dying while you're doing it. Despite being overpowered, it feels tense. In a way, it's, it's kind of a lot like Final Fantasy XVI, where the bosses are generally pretty easy, and you're not going to die on them, but you think you could die, and that makes it exciting. The world in Final Fantasy VIII feels big. You wander around cities and towns that actually look and feel kind of like cities and towns. And there are so many people to talk to. In modern games, there are lots of NPCs who stand there but say nothing, and they're just there to make it feel more populated. Having an NPC just say something as you walk past isn't nearly as much fun as stopping and talking to them like in the older games. Baldur's Gate 3 is an interesting recent example where in most of the game everyone has a name and something to say, but then in Act 3 it just burdens the screen, and your CPU, with a bunch of generic citizens who don't even light up when you use the highlight characters. In Final Fantasy VIII, you can even explore very early on, despite the fact that there's no reason to take a train anywhere. And that makes it feel so much more open compared to, say, the endless intro corridor of 9 or 13. In terms of the characters here, there are only six in your party. Only two of them, Squall and Renault, are really a focus of much characterization, but the other four still feel fairly real, and they usually do have more than one note. I had heard people call Squall emo for about a quarter of a century, and then I was stunned by how not emo I thought he actually was in the game. It's not 0%, of course, but the game shows his internal monologue frequently, and it often doesn't entirely match what the other characters think he's thinking. This guy is an orphan who was taken to be a child soldier mercenary and the weight of the world is on him, and I think he's actually pretty well adjusted when you consider that. He's angsty, yes, but not in a one-note way. He's actually competent at his job, and he largely follows the rules. There's an extended segment where he wants to give his formal report and people just keep delaying him. His arc is also great, in part because it does show you what he's thinking and you see how that evolves. He's not very nice early on, but again, think of the life he's lived to that point. He warms up to his teammates fairly quickly, and while he grumbles about responsibility, he does do his duty. Since I'm going to tear into Zidane in FF9 for his behavior towards women, I should note that there is a part where it looks like Squall almost hits Renoa, although she's laughing enough at it, I'm not entirely sure what is supposed to be happening in that animation, but I do need to point that out, given what I am about to say about Zidane later, I think it would not be fair. The plot of this game is kind of standard Final Fantasy absurdity. That's really all that needs to be said, but I think the payoffs for its mysteries are great. When I replayed this game in 2023 to get footage and to refresh my memory, I was not disappointed. I'd had three years since I last played it, thinking about how great it had been, and I was worried I might be disappointed. If anything, I might have enjoyed it even more the second time. For that run, I wanted to do all the tricks to get overpowered early, doing tons of triple triad and card mod to stock up on high-level spells. I wanted to look up the exam answers so I could buy tents to make Kiragas early. I wanted to get the Lionheart on disc one. I looked up and did all the side quests in minigames. I fought and defeated Omega Weapon with an average character level of 26. It was an absolute blast. Well, except for the stupid Queen of Cards stuff. That was miserable. Don't, 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 do not let those stupid plus plus random rules or whatever it is spread like a plague upon the land. And also the Chocobo Whistle thing wasn't great. But the rest of it was fantastic. I enjoyed it and the junction system so much I barely ever summoned a girlfriend after the very beginning. I was just having too much fun with other things. I happened to be playing it again in August 2023, which was a rough time for me, just, just like June 2020 was, and once again it gave me a great thing to look forward to each night. I played so much Triple Triad and I farmed so many cards off monsters while just lying in bed relaxing. It was amazing. I want to mention a few other things. The Balam Garden music reminds me of the Kelethon theme from EverQuest, which came out at about the same time, and I loved that music back then. That was my favorite theme in EverQuest. This game does do one thing I dislike. Like 2 and 5, it randomly removes some cities at the end of the game, and I kind of prefer an endgame where you can explore everything right up to the last minute. But this game might have the best Bigs and Wedge, and they have a wonderful arc. I'd say that of all the Final Fantasy games I played for the first time in the pandemic, this is the one that has lived in my head the most. I just think it's neat. And the ending managed to be moving in just the right ways. Final Fantasy IX, where I have a few more unpopular opinions. Of the Final Fantasy games that I didn't really like, I, am, I most imagine my comments would make people mad if they were big fans of, of 5 or 9. Fans of 7 are probably used to haters at this point, I assume, and I had nice things to say about that one at the end. And I have very many nice things to say about 9 as well, but, you know, I don't hear people criticize 9 very much, so I don't know how aghast fans of 9 are going to be here to, going to be to hear criticism about it. 9, like 7, was a comfort during a rough time. I first played it in May and June of 2020 on the Switch, when quarantine was really starting to wear at me, and it gave me something to look forward to after work. It hooked me enough that I felt like playing the other games I missed, and it really got the ball rolling on this whole project, but... 
but 9 really paled in comparison to others in the series. If you'd asked me at the end of 9 how I felt about it, I'd probably have gushed quite a bit. But that was before I'd played 8, which really blew me away. There are two big problems with 9 for me. The main character and the game's speed and pacing. I'm going to spend maybe too much time complaining about both of those before getting into what I really loved about it. On the topic of speed, while I was going through all the Final Fantasy games, a friend of mine said it made him want to replay 9, so he did. But then he said he got so bored in the intro corridor and he just stopped. And boy, does this game have a long intro corridor. I tend to think of the intro corridor in a game as the portion where you're on rails while it explains core mechanics to you and sets the stage for the plot. It's when you don't have much ability to explore or do anything but what's right in front of you. When we get to Final Fantasy XIII, we'll see what it's like when the intro corridor is the game, which is kind of impressive in its own way. But Final Fantasy IX is pretty heavy on it too. I didn't notice this as much when I first played it because everything was new and I wasn't trying to get to any particular point, but when I replayed it, I had a bunch of parts of the game I was looking forward to, and I found I couldn't do them until I advanced past endless exposition. I wanted to explore, and I wanted to play Chocobo Hot and Cold, and instead I realized that, wow, this game has a lot of cutscenes, and they are not skippable. Beyond a minor breather where you can choose to get the Chocobo and Quina early, you do not get to explore for a very long time, and you don't have a healer for a long, long stretch at the beginning, which is a weird choice. Most Final Fantasy games don't let you do much exploration for a while, but it felt so much worse here. I think part of the issue is that in real time, it's much longer. You have to advance through a lot of plot in 4 and 6 before you can really explore beyond going to one or two towns slightly early, but it doesn't take that long if you're replaying the game and you just want to get to those parts. But, but still, in FF8, you could just go off and play Triple Triad for ages right at the start and get massively overpowered early, something I did on my second run, and I loved it. 8 just let you wander around much earlier, and I really like that. And on the subject of time, Final Fantasy IX is slow. It is glacially slow. Not just in how long before the world opens up, not just in how long the unskippable cutscenes are, but in how slowly you move on the overworld map, especially in the boat, and how slowly everything happens in battles. I remembered some of this from my first play, but boy, it was worse than I remembered when I replayed it. One edge that Final Fantasy VIII has here is that Final Fantasy VIII's remaster makes it really easy to increase the speed. All you have to do is tap the thumbstick to send it to three times speed mode. Toggling it on and off is incredibly easy. In Final Fantasy IX's Switch version, you have to pause the game and then press another button, and this option isn't always available, and I realize this sounds like a small thing. But from a user experience perspective, it really slows things down and makes it feel awkward and clunky. This is obviously not a fault of the original game, although I can fault the original for making battles so slow, even with the settings turned to their faster ends and making these cutscenes so long. It's just so many cutscenes. I didn't mind that at first because it was all new, but once I knew the scenes already, I just wanted to skip them and I couldn't. You do get to explore within towns and cities before things open up, but it feels a bit more like you're required to talk to everyone than that you're exploring. And in terms of the plot, I knew the twist about Terra and Gaia already because years earlier I had seen part of a YouTube video trying to explain it. It didn't cover the plot of Final Fantasy IX as you play through it, it was just explaining the backstory before the game begins. I don't think that hurt my initial experience at all, in fact it might have even made it better to vaguely know what was going on. It's a good story, even if in true Final Fantasy fashion you can't try to explain it without sounding delusional. I wonder what I would have thought of it if I hadn't understood what Garland was doing, but I don't think I'd have liked it more. The characters are where the game largely shines. I say largely because Zidane is the absolute worst Final Fantasy protagonist. He is horrible. You might be saying to the screen right now, what about Vaughn? I think part of why I hated Vaughn so much is because his physical resemblance to Zidane was so striking, but narratively, I agree, Vaughn is worse. The problem with Zidane is that he is a constant sex pest who engages in wildly inappropriate behavior over and over again, up to and including copying a feel on the main female protagonist he's been aggressively hitting on the whole game during an important moment. This is all made worse by the fact that he gets the girl anyway in the end, having never learned any lessons or experienced any growth as far as his harassment is concerned. And, and why does he let her think he's dead for a year? I feel like I missed that both times I played it. It didn't make any sense to me. He's so terrible. And in real life, we all know people like Zidane who are just so insistent that something, even something not sexual that makes us uncomfortable, is just totally normal. You know, you, why should you question it? Just go along with it. Why are you being a buzzkill? It's not even really explained by his backstory, which feels like he... It could have been attached to any other character with pretty much the same result. Making a thief the main character also led to the other problem with this game, stealing from bosses. In this game, they give each boss four tiers of things to steal, and the hardest ones to get are usually really good for where they are in the game. 
This unfortunately makes boss fights take ages as you sit there healing yourself and trying not to kill the boss while Zidane fails to steal over and over and over again. And then you finally get it and you think, yay, I found that item. And then in the next town is for sale. And there isn't a single random encounter where you would have even used the item between the boss and buying the item. And then you discover one lying on a bench where you can just take it for free. Again, before any fighting. And any guide you were looking at will have said, be sure to steal the knife. But on my first run, oh yes. Oh, I did try to steal the fairy flute. Oh, I sat there for an hour trying and then saw on the internet how lucky I was that it only took one hour. I don't have footage of that because I'm not doing it again. Although on my second run, I still couldn't resist stealing at least a few times on bosses just to remind myself how horrible it was. My recommendation to you, if you haven't played this game, is to just not try to steal from bosses. Just don't do it. Only near the end of the game is any of the gear unique, and when you have to wait to get it later, it's usually not that much later than you would have gotten if you'd just stolen it from the boss. If I may make one more point about the stealing system, it's designed in such a way that Zidane will fail to steal over and over again, but people who want to be pedantic on the internet a group I would usually happily count myself in will insist that you are in fact not failing to steal once you have the thief glove. And this will confuse beginners because it's, it's saying you're failing. But what it really means is you successfully stole from an empty slot. Anyway, Zidane sucks. He's also needlessly mean to Steiner, who is a far superior character. He works for comic relief moments as well as dramatic ones. His respect for his comrades, except for Zidane, who does not deserve it, is wonderful to watch. Especially his immediate bond with Vivi. I didn't fall in love with Vivi the way everyone else on the internet appears to, but I still like the character quite a lot. His existential crisis is much deeper and more interesting than Zidane's. Garnett is allowed to be silly and foolish at times, and her backstory revelation is also very well handled. She has a great arc over the course of the game. Quina is a fun twist on a blue mage. Freya doesn't get that much to do in the story, but we all love her anyway. And Aiko is consistently hilarious. And only after replaying this game after Final Fantasy XVI did I realize her name is a reference to icons and summons. Oh, and I guess Amarant wins the Strago Award. I do think I made a major error in how I approached playing this game. Replaying Final Fantasy VII with a guide on hand at all points made sense, because it wasn't my first run and I just wanted to see everything, but it showed me how many absurd, permanently missable things there were in that era of gaming. I hope you played Tifa's piano in the flashback, because otherwise you can't get her ultimate limit break 30 hours later. So I played this game with a guide. My goal was to skim it as I was leaving each area so that I didn't miss things, and boy, this game is from an era that really loved punishing you for missing anything. But it's hard not to get some minor spoilers that way, especially when it tells you what abilities to equip for the boss. The bosses are generally pretty easy if you have the right abilities equipped, and I felt like I lost out on some of the challenge and skill building of the game by accidentally seeing what to equip before fighting a boss. And the ability system, by the way, is fantastic. Of all the ability spell learning systems that Final Fantasy has come up with, Jobs, Espers, Materia, Grids, Crystaria, Licensing boards. The ability training system here is the best. Armor and weapons let you use their abilities while they're equipped, and after getting enough points with them equipped, you learn them permanently. And for some abilities, you have a point allocation for which ones are active. This means you fight a boss that petrifies you, and you can come back in the next try and equip an anti-petrify ability. Or if there's one that requires you to float, you can come back and float. It's the most elegant, effective, easy to understand, fun to play version of any skill tree that they've devised. The only drawback is that sorting through all of that gear to see what you have and haven't learned takes a while and it's cumbersome. But that's already true of all of the other systems I mentioned. So this game gets an easy S tier for its skill system. On the unfortunate flip side, it has the worst limit break system of all of them. You could argue desperation attacks in 6 were too random or the mist in 12 was too exploitable, but trance is just a mess. It's extra wild because it serves a huge plot point in the game, so making it useless is just bizarre. Final Fantasy VII's limit breaks may have been too strong since you could just save them up to bosses, and eights because you could just trigger them over and over again, but those felt like an extra element of strategy to plan around. Trance is the opposite. Your meter fills up, and it goes off, and then it's gone. And this means you can be one hit away, and some trash mob right before the boss hits you and sets it off, and now your bar is totally empty for the boss fight. It makes no sense as a design, and it just creates needless frustration for the player. We've all watched our trances go off, and we cannot use them. Queen's, for instance, doesn't even work on bosses, so you want it to go off in different fights than everybody else's. The plus side is that you can largely ignore it. It slows combat down with its animation, and you have a feeling like you missed out on something that you wanted to save for the boss, but it's not really important. I've railed against mini-games before, and this game has one good example and one bad example. 
The bad example is Tetramaster, which I found to be a much more confusing and less fun version of Triple Triad, which also offered no in-game rewards, unlike Triple Triad, and a wild overcorrection from Abe. There's even a segment where you're forced to play it and you have to win a couple matches. By that point, I had completely forgotten the rules as I had tried my best to ignore it. But, despite any Chocobo-related minigame usually being one of the worst parts of any Final Fantasy game, here, Hot and Cold is actually a lot of fun. If you don't mind cheating, it's both really fun and easy on an accelerated speed, because the accelerated speed doesn't speed up the clock. I enjoyed this on my first run, as it's quite addictive, and I really enjoyed it on my second when I was willing to cheat with the speed. The only drawback is that they gate the super boss behind it, and that makes it kind of close to mandatory if you want to do the hardest fight, which isn't a great way to design that for people who do want to skip it. Even though, as I said, it is very fun. And Ozma is a great fight. I might think of Final Fantasy VII as a low point for super boss design, at least among the games that I played, but Final Fantasy VIII and IX are the high points. Both have bosses that function in very unique ways and reward you for truly understanding this fight. I was willing to just look up guides that explain both of them, but I still came up with my own strategy once I knew the mechanics, and I found it to be a lot of fun. On my first play, Ozma seemed like it would require me to level grind, and I decided to just not do that. But on my second run, I'd been using my Switch in handheld mode off-stream a bunch, and I had played enough that, yeah, I was, uh, I was ready to fight Ozma. The fight took a few tries, but it was really rewarding, especially when Freya was alive and managed to solo most of the boss's health, and then the boss killed itself with a doomsday. Again, I like Final Fantasy IX, VIII just called to me more. It's, it's so different look, tone, and pacing than VIII that I don't know if even comparing them makes sense. And I liked IX enough to be bitten by the Final Fantasy bug again, but replaying it lowered my opinion of it a bit after experiencing all the other games. This was the very last one I replayed at the end of collecting my footage here, and that was the impression that I came away with. Still a great game, not as much fun on the replay. Final Fantasy X, the most properly rated Final Fantasy game. Final Fantasy X was the first of the games that I played on stream for the first time. So, you know, excluding remakes like the Pixel Remasters where I already knew the games. So as such, this is the first game where I have my initial reactions to everything. Uh, I had bought this game uh, for the PS2 back in the day when it was one of those like, cheap Game of the Year editions uh, in fall 2004. But I ended up never having time to play it because a certain MMO came out in uh, the fall of 2004 that ended up taking up most of my video game time for the next, let's just say, seven years. So instead, I ended up playing this game in July 2022 on a desktop on Steam, uh, a version where there is one issue you want to know about. Uh, for the most part, it ran very well, but uh, some cutscenes will just be green. I, I don't know why. You'll have to just look them up on YouTube afterwards. That's what happened to me. It only happened a few times, but it did happen. So my original plan was just to play this so that I could then stream Kingdom Hearts for a Disney-loving friend of mine who had put up with a lot of my Final Fantasy rambling over quarantine. I knew Kingdom Hearts started with characters from 10, so I thought I should play this first, even though as it turns out, you really don't need to and they're barely in it. Uh, and it wasn't my goal to then go and play any other Final Fantasy games after that. So I'd wanted to play 10 originally back in 2022 after doing eight and nine, but my Switch didn't have enough room to download it, and I thought I might still find that old PS2 CD around my parents' place when I could visit them again. We dug up a lot of very cool old games, but we did not find that one. Uh, so I was wary going into this game, because when I had looked into it, I heard that instead of leveling, you have these spheres. And I just immediately lost a lot of interest. I didn't want some hyper-complicated leveling system, and a picture of the full sphere grid was enough to make me not want to play very much. I even clipped myself learning the sphere grid because I was so demoralized the first time the game showed it to you. But the reality is, the sphere grid looks a lot worse than it is. It's actually pretty functional. There are only a few points where I thought it would cause problems for me. You know, Kimari spent most of the game on the bench because I moved him in some wrong direction early on, and I just didn't feel like using him. It required more advanced planning than I think was ideal for a first playthrough of a game. Uh, I wish you could completely reset it, like the licensing boards in 12, assuming there isn't a way to do that that I'm just not familiar with. But overall, it just kind of worked. No, no real objections. And keeping my party up to date, as long as I didn't do anything really wasteful with their spheres, just wasn't that hard. The leveling system is incredibly smooth. Modern games like Baldur's Gate 3 will just give people who are not in the party EXP to avoid having to do what you know older Final Fantasy games had as a problem, which is where there'd be somebody you'd neglect or you'd get later in the game, and then they'd just be unplayably bad and underleveled and not have all the skills. We're looking at you, Strago. Uh, 10 comes from an era before people had accepted the solution of just giving everybody experience. So you do have to make each party member contribute, but they only need to take one action in combat to get full experience. 
And that works extremely well because it doesn't cost you any turns switching characters in and out. I was expecting it to be a cumbersome process where every fight required me to give up turns just to cycle people in and take one hit and then cycle them back out again. As it turns out, there's no cost other than the slight inconvenience of just pressing the buttons to cycle them in and out. I'd have preferred not to have to do that at all, but it did make me play with each party member a little bit, which is better than never playing half the characters and better than being forced to play someone underpowered at a key moment. This was the first fully voiced Final Fantasy game uh, I played, which makes it all the funnier that it avoided ever saying the certain main character's name, so we can now spend two decades arguing about whether it's pronounced Titus or Titus. It seems what I can find that it should be Titus, but I've said Titus for so long in my head that, uh, that I, don't, I don't think I, I cannot be disciplined enough to say Titus consistently. It's not going to happen. Anyway, I really enjoyed this game, and I called it the most properly rated game in the series because it seems like everybody else did too. People are always squabbling over whether 7 is overrated, it is, or whether 9 is underrated, it isn't. Uh, but I don't think I've heard any of that for 10. Everyone says it's great, and it is great. It was neither more nor less great than everybody said. It's one of the absolute best games in the series. So I mentioned how smooth the combat feels, and that's part of it. It, let you, it, lets you, it lets you do things like grind up gold early on to get an instant death um, doll for Lulu early. And I just I did that, and I just enjoyed using it so much and saving her MP. I don't know why. That just brought me a lot of joy. Uh, and then when Waka got the Petrify Ball, I loved that too, because every time he throws that damn ball, it was funny. Uh, so yeah, then the Switch summons me as beings who fight in place of you rather than things that pop up, cast a spell, and go away. That was a really interesting tra change. I actually uh, did quite like it, even though I wouldn't like how it was implemented in, say, Final Fantasy XII or Final Fantasy XIII. And, you know, the fights were a little overly long with some of them in sixteen, but we'll get there. And the characters in this game, they're great. Uh, Tidus is kind of annoying, but he's one of the least objectionable Final Fantasy protagonists in terms of his personality. He's mostly just doofusy and overenthusiastic. Kimari is a little one-note and kind of a stock character, but the others are all great. Walk is voiced by Bender from Futurama. He's consistently entertaining, aside from his Albed racism. Uh, his sports balls, as I said, really fun to throw. Lulu was quite funny, and I liked her dry sarcasm at the other characters while she's attacking with dolls. Uh, and her overdrive didn't work on the Steam version. I, it just didn't seem to do anything when I pressed the buttons I was supposed to be pressing, and it sounds like this is actually a somewhat common problem. And her outfit may have been ridiculous, but she was at least mostly covered, uh, unlike Riku. Uh, I didn't enjoy that much as a character. Her fear of lightning was kind of endearing. The fact that she moved quickly and killed mach it could kill machines by stealing from them was very fun mechanically, but not a ton else to say there. Yuna, I think, has an absolutely gorgeous design. Her dress is fantastic. Her voice acting is top-notch. Uh, I've seen other people do Yuna impressions, and I, I love them all. They're, they're all. they're just great. So everything with her character, including the story, it's just so beautiful. But my favorite was Arin. He had such a great voice, such great line readings. I loved his armor-piercing moves, his entire design aesthetic, his story. I liked having a fast swordsman in Tidus and a slower, more powerful one in Auron. In fact, Auron's appearance in Kingdom Hearts 2, which I was not expecting, was the highlight of that entire series for me. I also loved the cameo by the Final Fantasy X-2 people uh, as well. So the story is engaging, it's easy to follow for most of the game. You know, there's a Final Fantasy twist later on that's not going to make a ton of sense until you go Google a few things and look up and try to understand what's going on with the timeline. But I understood the consequences and the stakes of it, it didn't really hurt my enjoyment. In terms of the optional content for this game, I missed out on a lot of it because I accidentally beat the game when I meant to keep exploring. I like to put a game away for a while after the catharsis of beating it, which means I never went back into the super bosses, I never went to look for anima. I didn't find them before I ended up finding the final boss, and that's just kind of what happened. There were only a few negatives for me in this game. I wasn't a fan of Blitzball. I only did the one mandatory game of it. I won that one. I never did it again. I was sad the game of Blitzball turned out to be a lot longer than I thought. You know, that whoa, it was just the half. Ugh. And I don't actually know if you have to win that game like you do the Tetra Master in Final Fantasy IX, but it would have been better to just let me say no and never play it. The game is really complicated for something I did not enjoy and never wanted to do again. I also thought the upgrading system was awkward and annoying to deal with, but you could largely ignore it. In combat, it was sometimes hard to target the right enemy, but you know, that wasn't a major problem. I also lament that this is the first game to dispense with the overworld map, getting an airship and not getting to fly it around yourself. Uh, it just makes me sad. It also made the world feel a little disconnected, which is ironic given it really is more connected in this game than it is in the others. You know, you're not going from an icon to an icon over some separate path. You're going from zone to zone. 
But if you ask me to visualize the world map in 10, I, I can't. I can't visualize it. I can visualize it for you know, 1 through 9, can't visualize it for 10. But those are some fairly minor negatives. Streaming this game was where I learned you can get big fans of old Final Fantasy games to just pop up in chat, even if you don't do anything that would ever make anyone want to watch your, your stream. They'll just pop in because they see it's a first playthrough and it's their favorite game and they just want to see somebody experience it for the first time. You can just geek out with them about it and you have great chats. And that was why I ended up playing the other Final Fantasy games because I was having these chats with the people in there. They got so excited about it. They asked if I might play some of the other ones I hadn't played. I decided I'd do it. So, yeah, I mean, this game was a fantastic experience. I just absolutely treasured it. Uh, I think back on it very fondly. Uh, this is, I think this is probably a fine option to make your first game. I wouldn't put it high on the list of games to play first, just because while it works very well on, on its own terms, it doesn't really introduce you to Final Fantasy mechanics specifically the way that, say, a 4 would, and it's not, it, it doesn't have the breakthrough iconic nature to non-Final Fantasy fans the way that 7 does, but, I mean, it's a great game. So, highly recommended. As I said, it's the only one that's just perfectly rated. Everybody agrees. It's great. Final Fantasy X-2. It was very weird, but it was very enjoyable. Okay, so now we come to one of the games that I was really conditioned to think that I would not like. I'd heard awful things about it. The cover picture was absurd to me. While I was playing FF10, when I'd open it up and I'd see the bit for uh, FF10 2 as well, I would just think, what on earth happens to get them to that point? You've got Yuna in hot pants dual-wielding pistols, which is a slightly different characterization than she had in the first game. You know, it managed to find bits of clothing it could remove from Riku and not get an M rating. Uh, I thought Pain was Lulu, just based on that art. The game then reuses a bunch of uh, maps and enemy models, a lot like uh, 4 After Years, which you will recall I was not overly fond of. The enemies seemed wildly out of place compared to the first game. I fought an Iron Giant really early on, but some nerfed hollow-feeling version. This gave all kinds of After Years vibes, and that is not where you want to be. In addition, and, you know, to be a little evasive about spoilers here in case somebody somehow came to listen to my part talking about 10-2 without having first played 10, which I'm, I'm sure could theoretically happen, uh, 10 probably had the most beautiful and emotional ending of any Final Fantasy game, and the entire plot of this game is about Yuna's quest to undercut that ending. So I went in with really low expectations, and I have to tell you, I enjoyed this game. It's still weird, and a lot of it doesn't make any sense, but it was a wild ride. The story here is that Yuna, Riku, and a new character named Pain, whose entire backstory and relevance to the plot I apparently completely missed in an optional cutscene, are now treasure hunters called the Gullwings. Uh, Yuna received a sphere with a message from Titus, claiming to be trapped in a prison cell, and she wants to find him and see how it is that he still exists after the end of the last game. What actually ends up happening is complete nonsense, but to my happy surprise, it didn't end up ruining the ending of 10. Because I didn't get the secret ending. Uh, I probably would have been very unhappy if I'd gotten the secret ending, but it's hard to imagine me getting the secret ending. <sighs> anyway, the rest of the game is wild. It opens with Yuna doing some kind of pop star concert thing, wildly out of character for her. Uh... And then she's not, but at least she's not in the hot pants yet. So you're like, okay, maybe this is Yuna, but then it's not her. It's someone else dressed as her because in this game, the big mechanic is you can switch outfits that are called dress spheres. And most of those outfits are actually pretty amusing. They're not all randomly skimpy. Uh, I could see the idea that Yuna is trying to get out of her shell and it's affecting her persona a little bit. I still don't really think she would dress in that core outfit. Um, and the Sailor Moon style costume changes... Just like, they didn't need to take that long. Um, I, I recall you could you could switch that off after a while, but that was... Uh, the, in FF10, one of the great things about switching characters in and out was that it didn't delay or pause the game at all. And it was a little unfortunate then that, at least initially when you play this game, you do have these pauses as you're switching spheres, because it is very similar to switching the characters in and out of the first game. But it's not a huge problem. So the crew the Gullwings travel with is annoying. Brother is the is one of the most obnoxious characters from any of the uh, of the Final Fantasy games, and there's a lot of him. Uh, Shinra, whose big claim to fame here is that he's kind of an Easter egg in Seven Remake, connecting the continuity of two Final Fantasy games for the first time. I didn't really care about him otherwise, but that was a neat bit. There's a recurring antagonist you eventually have to give a back massage to in what is even for this game a little weird. So, so I played this on Steam. Like 10, it had the occasional cutscene issue where the cutscenes would just become green screens for a while. 
Um, so that's a few complaints to sort of start off with a game, but I'm still going to say I had a great time playing it. Those things in it are all weird, and they don't stop being weird, but they don't stop the game from being fun. The dress spheres are just really fun. They're, they're, you know, they're not that hard to manage. They're very much like the job system from 3 or 5, but in, you know, in an upgraded, um, more modern way. It's not overwhelming. The mechanics of firing the guns, it's just fun pressing the buttons. I like pressing buttons. You know, given that I played this as essentially a free add-on to Final Fantasy X, I have no complaints about it. You know, if, if I'd paid full retail when it came out, and maybe I'd have been a little annoyed because it would feel a little bit like a DLC to FF10 using a bunch of reused assets and all of that, but I didn't play it that way, and I had a blast. I still rank this fairly lowly among Final Fantasy games, but only because the others are better. It's not in the After Years category. But speaking of the After Years category, Final Fantasy XI. I played as much as I could. So I want to preface my discussion of Final Fantasy XI by saying that my experience playing it in 2023 is not necessarily indicative of its overall quality. And what I mean by that is, this is an MMO that you have to pay a subscription for and it is still seeing enough players two decades after its release that it's still running. There is clearly something special about this game to those players. But I was able to pick up all of the other games on this list and play them without struggling anything like I did just trying to play this one. And I mean that both for playing the game and for just trying to get it to run. In fact, I spent about as much time trying to make it run as I was willing to spend playing it, which is about two hours. And I think it probably actually took considerably longer than that, but I didn't record most of the time I was trying to get it to run. After a while, I just started streaming myself playing 14 while showing this unexpected, you know, second download patch thing that just kept going. I had no idea it was going to be as hard and as frustrating just getting it to run as it was. I had to make multiple accounts to do it, and they sent me tons of different logins and passwords I, that I didn't keep track of initially because I didn't think I'd have to. And, and they were closely enough in terms of what they wanted me to do that I kept confusing which was which, and I had to <laughs> end up having to reset them all. Uh, I, I could go on, but you get the idea. Trying to play this game is a mess, even for the free demo. The gameplay itself, well, when I tried 14, I could just start playing it, and all of my knowledge from World of Warcraft immediately applied, and I could just jump right into it. I'd played World of Warcraft for about seven years from its release until, you know, mid-2012, uh, and I hadn't touched it in over a decade, but I still understood the basics, and I could pick up 14 and be like, yes, this is similar enough to World of Warcraft, I understand all of these controls, I understand how to make all of this work, this is fine. There were things I had to learn that were different, uh, of course, but, you know, the game explained them to me. Eleven, on the other hand, okay, so it required me to keep open a browser tab just explaining the controls. I found myself targeting an NPC and typing slash attack because it was the only way I could figure out to attack things. There was a server message and I couldn't read it fast enough and I couldn't figure out how to scroll the text up, so I just didn't know what it said. So these are some very basic things that I struggled with, and I hadn't struggled with those in a game in I don't, I don't know how long. I mean, obviously, the ports that I've played of a lot of the other Final Fantasies were versions that were released you know, much later than when this game originally com came out, but as I understand it, this game has also had any number of, of overhauls to varying degrees over the years. So I decided, after gaining a few levels, I'm going to try attacking this orc in the starting zone. It destroyed me. When I finally tried to do a quest, I was struggling with the map navigation, and I ran into another group of orcs. One saw me, and I learned, as I ran through the entire zone, you just have to zone out to get them to stop chasing you, a lot like EverQuest, more so than World of Warcraft. So I completed this one fetch quest, and I decided, all right, that's it. I'm, I, can't, I can't put this anymore. I'm not having fun. It's somewhat frustrating. With the other Final Fantasy games, you know, a nice way of explaining what it means to have played them is to say, you know, I played it until I saw the end credits. And that's been my goal for most of the other games. Even with 14, as we'll get to, you know, there were end credits where I got, even if I didn't do all of the expansions. I do, I do hope to do them someday. I don't know if 11 even has credits anywhere, but this is the only game where, you know, I didn't play to them. Uh, I played EverQuest for, you know, a year or so, maybe two, when it came out, and so I understand how this game may have been amazing when it came out, because it gave me a lot of EverQuest vibes throughout. I can understand why, from that experience, people might still play this game two decades later, with all the nostalgia and built-up community and so on. But this also felt much closer to EverQuest and World of Warcraft, which was more fun, and, you know, I played many times longer in World of Warcraft than I did EverQuest. You know, seven years is a lot longer than one, maybe two. And this game came out closer to WoW's release than EverQuest, and it's had 20 years to evolve. So, Eleven is going to have to go with After Years in the unfortunate category of games I didn't enjoy and I don't recommend you play. 
I'm sure by now the story is very evolved, and if I understood how to play it, it would be rewarding, but this was my experience playing it in 2023, and if you tried to play it for the first time in 2023, I imagine you would feel similarly. Final Fantasy XII, the one that I knew absolutely nothing about. So, uniquely among the games here, I knew nothing about Final Fantasy XII going in, and I mean nothing. I didn't know what system it was released on, who the main character was, who the villain was, what the story was, what the mechanics were, what art style was used, whether it was turn-based, and so on. Literally the only thing I knew about this game was that when I mentioned I was going to play it to a friend, um, she just asked, is that the one with the bunny lady? And yes, it was the one with the bunny lady. So the version I played was the Zodiac Age on Steam. I didn't have any technical issues with it, but bear in mind that means it's been cleaned up from the original version. So when a lot of my friends had very negative things to say about it based on their experiences with its original release, uh, I didn't have a lot of those problems. And those friends implied that the original had a lot less functionality, particularly in the Gambit system, and I really love the Gambit system, so bear that in mind. But I enjoyed this game a lot. Even though chat asked me at one point if I was even having enough fun to like want to keep playing, early on there, there were a few transition costs with the system because it does take a little bit to learn compared to some of the other ones. Um, in, my, in my original draft of the script for this, you know, this read, reading about Final Fantasy XII, it didn't sound like I enjoyed the game. Like I had to rewrite it. I had, I had a whole two-page rant about the licensing void mechanic, and you know what? I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna sum it up uh, by saying that it, it, it's the form of the sphere grid, Crystarium, uh, for this game, and it's incredibly bore. It's an incredibly boring and bizarre name to give uh, in a game at, at all about rebelling against an empire. We're, gonna, we're rebelling against an empire, and we're going to go do these things on a licensing board because we need a license for these weapons that we're using to attack. The, I, I, nothing. It's also a bad implementation of a skill tree, and apparently it was much improved for Zodiac Age. Uh, the sphere grid looked like a tangled mess, but it wasn't that bad to manage in practice. Whereas the licensing board looks elegant, but is actually a tangled mess in practice. It's too hyper-specific. You don't just learn how to use shields, you learn how to use shields 2 and shields 3, which contain specific shields. I found out that my Shikari could only use shields 3, so they couldn't use the shield 1 that I had. Apparently it's beneath their ability to use. The worst part is that there are 22 levels of accessories, which is how absurdly granular the licensing board gets. It's really cumbersome to know what you would need from a merchant, because it doesn't show something that you could learn, it just shows something you can't currently use. So I haven't invested the points in into an item, so I don't know if I can use it or not, so I have to go through everybody's boards and see who might be able to use the item that that is. Having to find a cool sword and then also grind points to use it is anticlimactic, and it makes neither the moment of finding the sword nor grinding the points exciting. There's no benefit in gameplay to adding this extra step, although I think the purpose was probably to restrict multi-classing, which may or may not have even been possible in the original version. It's a mess to find things on this licensing board, and I wasted a ton of time trying to find Cure instead of Cure Off or a Red Mage, only to find out that Red Mages just don't learn Cure. Uh, I couldn't, I also, I could also see tiles for the green magic spells, and I played a lot of hours of this game, and in 40 hours, I never found a single green magic spell, ever. You know, after a while, it became a matter of principle not to look up where to find them, because the game wasn't going to tell me. I've played every number in Final Fantasy, and I didn't even know what green magic was. For this video, I finally looked it up and saw that it's connected to the setting of Ivalice, and so it's part of the tactics games, which I do eventually intend to play, but have not yet played. So I now know, as I somewhat inferred from the abilities that were listed there, that it was status effects. But looking it up, the Zodiac Age apparently recategorizes a lot of it as other types anyway. Right. So finding spells is another miserable part of the game, as you might gather from that. You... you what you want may be hidden in some random merchant or some chest that only has a whatever percent chance of having what you want, I think. I missed out on Holy because I later found out I missed the chest it was in, or maybe the chest hadn't spawned and the dungeon it was in was so miserable to navigate, I just, I just didn't want to go back when I found out where it was. Another big issue with the licensing board is that it doesn't actually give you anything that you've earned. The worst part of the whole game, of the parts that I did, was getting the the, the Hastiga spell after I, I just gave up and I, and I googled where it was and trying to find... It was, it was awful. It was, it was horrible. So, also on the minus side, the limit break system in this game is called Mist, and I got through the entire game without ever really understanding what I was doing. I was trying not to look up too much for most of this game, because, again, I didn't know much about it going in, and I thought it would be interesting to do that. And I kept getting various spoilers whenever I would try to look anything up, so I just, I just stopped looking things up. Now, I never needed to use Mist, so I use it from time to time. It was never a priority for me to figure it out. My understanding is that it's pretty busted if you do know what you're doing with it. I used to get annoyed when I'd see streamers just not learn how to use a mechanic in a Final Fantasy game, but after this game, I get it. I see you, streamers. I understand. I had a little resentment at the game's refusal to explain things. So, you know, most games, I do just look up the mechanics, but 
sometimes there's fun to exploring it on your own and learning as time goes on, which comes up a lot in the Final Fantasy XIII trilogy, where I really did enjoy how I learned more about the core mechanics like right up to the final phase of the final boss of Lightning Returns. In any event, from seeing other people play this game later, Mist is apparently completely ridiculously busted, and with the right RNG, you, you can just kill anything. So I can't go on without mentioning that my first exposure to the dreaded disease mechanic, which makes it so your HP just constantly lowers as you're, as you're getting hit, this condition is so hard to cure that I had to find a crystal just to get rid of it. And you have to cure it. <laughs> you have to cure, cure people from it because everybody just ends up at 1 HP and you just can't continue unless you cure it. I don't know why they made that one so hard to heal and so devastating to get. And from what I've seen of other people playing the game, they also don't understand that. So, okay, back to the licensing board. This is the first game where we start seeing shared party experience, sort of. Experience to level isn't shared, but the licensing board points are. So I ended up mostly playing Pinello as my lead character with, with Ash and Fran, mostly because I initially just made them classes that I ended up enjoying more than everybody else's. You know, Vaughn just ended up as a heal bot because he was annoying as a character, but it wasn't an intentional design choice. I was never really punished for sticking to those three characters because when I wanted to use someone else later, they had all their accumulated points, and improving their character through levels was fast enough at higher level enemies. And speaking of Vaughn, uh, I think he is the worst lead character uh, after Zidane, and Zidane is only worse because he's just a sex pest. Van is your standard, you know, doofus, blank slate protagonist who has to learn the world around him as an audience surrogate of sorts. But he's such an idiot who jumps in and says exactly the wrong thing all the time in the most annoying way possible. His character design even reminded me of Zidane's. It also doesn't make any sense that he's even on this quest. He just sort of was in the right place at the right time and everyone in the group was just like unwilling to kick him out. Penelo is kind of the same, but she isn't actively annoying. And when she does actually get to do anything, she's usually pretty competent and entertaining, which is part of why I liked her as a character and I just kept her as my lead character. Speaking of just the story and the plot, you get captured a lot of times in this game. Um, but, you know, overall, and somewhat like the original Star Wars trilogy, which you know, people compare uh, various Final Fantasy games to saying, oh, well, the, it's just, the plot is just Star Wars. This is the one where it's really just Star Wars. Like, every other one is kind of a joke. This one, it's actually just Star Wars. Um, but this game, like Star Wars, does a great job of depicting a world where there's just a lot else going on. It's hinting at a bigger picture. It's got details you just infer. It doesn't feel like it has to explain everything. I found this to be very true with the judges. I know this shares a world with Final Fantasy Tactics, so I assume a lot of that comes in then, and I'll learn more about it when I do that. But in that way, you know, it makes a surface playthrough of the game, very similar to my first experience as a child watching Star Wars, which I absolutely loved. Uh, and I thought the story with the Acuria was, was just narratively and philosophically quite fascinating. I, I thought it was great. But one unfortunate element of listening to the story in this game is that while I think all of the voice actors do a phenomenal job, it sounds like they're talking to you through the drive through window at a fast food restaurant. I, I don't know why that is. I assume there's some technical reason for that. But, on the other hand, you know, I thought the visually the design architecture in this game is really interesting. I just liked how they looked, uh, especially the starting city. It just had an interesting feel. I thought the music went along with it very well. Uh, I appreciate that this is one of those Final Fantasies that just lets you wander around a lot early without any artificial gates. You know, there are some gates, but once you get into the desert, you can just wander off way further than you should, and just the level of the enemies is what's going to keep you back. And I always love it when the games do that. So let's move on to the highlight of this game, the Gambit system. So the licensing board, as I said, is annoying. Vaughn is annoying. Um, trying to pronounce his name consistently is annoying, uh, for me at least. Finding spells is annoying, but you don't spend that much of your actual time uh, playing the, when, you, when you're playing the game, you're not spending that much time actually dealing with those things. Whereas every moment in combat involves the gambit system. And the gambit system lets you program your party members with commands like attack the enemy with the highest maximum HP, or cast cure on a party member below 50% HP, and then that you can prioritize those commands. In a way, this means the game is kind of playing itself like an auto-battler, but I found it very fun in practice, and you know, you do step in to make decisions fairly frequently, so it's not just playing himself. And it was just nice not to have to do the grunt work of just, oh, they've got to, oh, somebody switch over to poison, go, you know, to anti-poison, go cure that person, go uh, raise this person, go do this cure. I really liked it for the sort of heal bot type activities. And I liked setting it so that my party members attack the enemies with the lowest absolute HP, you know, not the, not the highest, lowest percentage, but the lowest uh, number so that they would always take out the ads first. I just loved that as a design. It did come back to bite me in a couple of fights with infinitely spawning ads, but it worked extremely well for the majority of the game. I found a lot of the default attack instructions had them jumping around between bad guys and not focusing their DPS effectively, which is why I came up with that structure for it. And just dreaming up how you want your team to act, it's a lot more fun than it sounds. You know, you... 
One thing, though, about that interaction with the mechanics is if you, you pause the game when you cast spells, which felt a lot like Secret of Mana, some people might consider that a plus, some might consider that a minus. It was certainly not a very positive experience for me when I played Secret of Mana that, you know, the rest of the game stops. You and your friends are playing this, and the whole thing has to stop every time you cast a spell, and the correct strategy on bosses in that game was often to just spam spells. But it was not nearly as uh, intrusive uh, in this game as it was in Secret of Mana. So I don't remember this game being very difficult once I had my gambit set up properly, although some random parts could still expose a flaw in my composition, mostly a flying boss, one part where I found out the sp enemies did in fact spawn indefinitely. You know, I wasn't supposed to just sit there and die. I still don't know what the mechanics were on the final boss, I just know that we won. Uh, I enjoyed this game enough, I wanted to go and do all the hunting quests before finishing it, but ultimately the sheer volume of them and how much you had to run around between them became just too much, and I just finished the game instead. As a result, I never fought the infamous dragon with the absurd number of hit points. Uh, so I didn't get the full Final Fantasy XII experience. I didn't have to let it sit there playing itself. For all the non-MMO Final Fantasies, this was the one where I left the most um, on the table in terms of content I didn't do. Just because there were so many side quests and no green arrows directing to them, and because running around got a little tiresome after a while, there was even a, a, a funny bit where I was doing side quests and I discovered that all this time teleporting was costing me teleportation stones that I had just never noticed I even had because I'd always had so many it didn't matter. And when I looked up how to buy more, it was kind of cumbersome. And yeah, that was a factor in not doing, not doing more of the side quests. Anyway, a few other notes in the design. It definitely shows that this is the first post-MMO Final Fantasy coming after 11. Its integration of the main screen in combat is a lot like 11 and 14, even though uh, 13 would revert to separate combat screens. It also felt like it belonged to the MMO era in terms of the expectation that I would look things up, especially where things were. I didn't have remotely as much trouble needing to stop and look things up in Final Fantasy X as I did in 12, and you know, I, I resented that it wouldn't tell me a lot of things that it probably should have. But not having random encounters was very nice. The respawns um, could be a bit much, but not having them be random all the time was at least... That, that was a nice improvement in the series, I thought. Knowing what to sell and what to hold on to was so miserable that I just never sold anything. This problem would get a nice fix in 13, so look forward to that. I also missed the traditional summons, who are instead, you know... The traditional summons being, like, you know, Shiva, Freed, Bahamut, etc. The fact that they're used, they're used as the names of airships rather than the ones that you actually summon. Uh, it keeps the Final Fantasy X system of actually summoning them as a thing that's that's there, which I didn't I didn't really summon enough things to have a strong opinion about how it's implemented in this game, which probably tells you something. Um, but there are mostly these are minor issues when you have a game with a compelling story, a very functional and deep combat system, gorgeous places, plenty of atmosphere, the architecture of Rabinoster combined so well with the music that you know it, it just felt neat. I just thought it was neat. I also liked the style of the concept art, even if Amino is, is still my favorite, although sadly you don't really see the concept art much in the game. So it takes a little patience to get into this game, and you have to accept it's going to play very differently from most of the other games in the series, but I think it's really worth it, and in the end it left me with a very positive impression. It has a compelling villain, it has a satisfying ending. I look forward to when I can play Tactics and just explore this setting just a little bit more. Final Fantasy XIII. So what if the intro corridor was the game? Okay, I went into Final Fantasy XIII with low expectations. I'd been told it was very sci-fi, that the plot was basically Star Wars, although, you know, it's, as I said in my Final Fantasy XII review, it is kind of a meme at this point to say every Final Fantasy is just Star Wars. But, you know, I'd heard people were pretty burnt out by the end of the trilogy of thirteen games, and I knew Lightning was a very divisive protagonist, although I didn't really know much about you know, the, the game or the combat system or why that any of that would be. So my experience with this game had an interesting arc. It had bounced around a lot between positive sentiments and negative sen sentiments. I really liked the look of it, and I liked, I liked the whole beginning portion. You know, it had some neat ideas with a false E, even if you had to spend a lot of time in the menu to understand it. But it made me want to understand it, because it was intriguing. I got confused over where Cocoon was exactly, and whether it was the thing in the sky and the opening cinematic, but then why planes seemed to warp to Pulse instead of just flying down from Cocoon, and this confusion lasted much, much longer than it should have. This game's skill tree, the Crystarium, made a very strong negative impression on me when it popped up at the end of my first stream. It's kind of a straight line, but also not. You know, it doesn't deviate in an interesting way, and you can accidentally spend points progressing partway, not get an ability, and then not be able to take another ability you could have gotten with those points. 
And later in the game, it was so unbelievably slow to spend points because you don't just click on an orb and say, okay, and put all your points there. I genuinely do not understand why you have to hold down the button to spend points. I, I have no idea. I, I don't, it's just a trap to get you to accidentally spend partial points as far as I can tell. It seemed like they did a good job timing it so that just as you're about to completely, you know, complete the whole crystal arm that you have available, it just expands. And that kept uh, kind of annoying me at a normal pace of play because I really do like having them be finished. Maybe for a design reason you don't want your players to do that, but I would have liked them to be completely capped for at least a little bit. Mechanically, the big, inno big innovation for this game is the stagger meter, which was so good and so successful that it's gone on to become a staple in not just the 13 sequels, but it was also used sort of in 15, definitely in 16 and 7 Remake. It's just a core part of the series now, and I really liked it. It gave a nice flow to combat. I used to hate in some of the Final Fantasy games when you had bosses where you had to work really hard just to be able to damage them, and you had a brief window to actually do damage before they would become invulnerable again, and you have to start all over. In some ways, Stagger is that as a mechanic, so I might have thought that I wouldn't like it, but it actually just plays out very well. You generally know when it's coming, you can plan the fight around it. It also kept revealing more depth to me as the game went on. There were various bosses that forced me to learn more about how the Stagger system worked in order to beat them, and I felt like the final boss had one phase that forced me, uh, that really pushed me, and then one phase that just tested my awareness of the mechanic, and I thought that that was a nice sort of transition between um, those modes. This is also a good game to have people in, ch in chat who can explain things to you because I misunderstood the interaction between Ravagers and Commandos and the Stagger Meter, and they were able to kindly explain um, uh, just a little bit better than the game does uh, how one wants to shift those walls, why you want to shift them, and when you'd want to be one or the other. So I was getting really into this by the end, and I definitely didn't mind that I knew this mechanic would be back in the sequel. So speaking of Ravagers and Commandos, the other less successful mechanical innovation in this game is the roles. You pick one lead party member, and then the, well, for most of the, a lot of, a large portion of the game, you're not picking them, you just have them. And then the other party members just act on autopilot based on their roles, and you just have to hope the AI does what you want. I did not enjoy that part of this, although the truly galling part was that if your lead party member hit zero HP, you just instantly got a game over. I have no idea why that's in the game. It was horrible. It's, it's not a surprise that the later games removed it. So... In theory, I liked that an AI saboteur could automatically apply debuffs and an AI synergist could apply buffs, but in practice, they never seemed to apply the ones I wanted, and the success rate for debuffs to stick was just annoyingly low. In fact, you micromanage your team more in this game than in any other Final Fantasy despite the AI. It's just that instead of selecting their move when their turn comes up, you're constantly switching paradigms to reconfigure the group in tight time windows. I found that a little exhausting, and this was the first Final Fantasy where I felt like actions per minute was actually a relevant you know, personal stat to try to maximize. And it is a skill you develop, which is why I didn't hate it by the end of the game, because I'd gotten better at it, but it is a pretty big barrier early on for enjoying the game. So the summons in this game are weird. They're, yes, they're even weirder than some of the other ones that have made changes in the last few games. It forces you to use a summon early on in a fight where you can screw it up as I did several times, and you have to restart until you figure out what on earth the controls are. It was just such a bad introduction to the summons that I put them aside and never summoned them again until I was killing an Adamantois much later and I just needed to do that as part of the strategy. But, like in 12, you, you know, if you don't like the summons, you don't have to use them other than that one spot, so it wasn't a huge problem. I didn't like the fights where you gain each of the summons because they have these own weird things you have to achieve in order to get the summon. They weren't that interesting mechanically, and I had to Google to find out why in Vanille's it didn't care that Fang was applying debuffs. It turns out it had to be the person whose idol Eidolon it was, but the game didn't tell me that, and I was unhappy with that. And structurally, this game is very strange. I've talked about how the intro corridor tends to go in some Final Fantasies, the portion at the beginning where you basically go down a hallway with no control or ability to explore before the world opens up. And this game is basically just an intro corridor followed by a brief open area for side quests and then another long corridor. The initial intro corridor was 25 hours long in a game where my final save was 55 hours. And it was 17 hours before I could choose party members for the first time. I kept assuming it was done, or about to be done, and it just kept going. This is no doubt another part of why this game was so divisive, and not a surprise they completely shift back to exploration in the next game, and the series never looks back from there. Usually, in intro quarters, you can at least stop and chat with a few NPCs in a closed town. In this game, there, there isn't even that. Now, the dungeons, as, as far as you can even call them that, they don't even really have different paths. They're just barely even forks or even nooks to look for. Zones just aren't connected at all until you get to pulse 25 hours in, and you really don't get to talk to anyone or explore until then. 
And when you do, the people you talk to are just stones who monologue their stories and tell you to kill a thing. Those quests are probably going to be the bulk of your playing time if you do them all, and I do recommend playing around with them somewhat. I have no idea what percentage of them I did, but some were really funny, and one of them, the Neo Chu one, I did because I had insomnia and I was willing to just stay up late casting death until it worked, and then I fought the ads for 30 minutes. That segment is a big part of why my, my Steam time for this game is considerably longer than my save file, which I think 62 hours is what the actual Steam thing showed, although I don't think it took me five hours to kill that Neo Chu. In addition to having to explain having to chat around to explain the roles, I also needed them to prompt me towards how the upgrading system is meant to function. It was too complicated and unclear what I'd want to do or why I'd want to do it, unless I was looking it up, which I generally try not to do on my first place with some of these games. But on the plus side, this is the game where it starts telling you which items you can sell by just having a note that says, oh, a merchant would pay a lot for this one, so great, I will do that. And this was the first game where it started getting really generous about restarting when you die instead of going back to the last save point. You can restart in the second phase of a fight, for example, in the final boss, and that is a great change. I'm glad they kept that in, in the later games, too. The save points themselves are gloriously plentiful, except, annoyingly, for the one part where I really needed to end the stream on short notice. Um, but I think having long boss fights, which this game does, uh, I normally don't like the long boss fights because every time you die, you have to go back and just redo 20 minutes to get to the part where you died. This game doesn't make you do that. You know, if you have to redo phase two a million times. You don't have to redo phase one before that each time, and I, that just made me happy. I think I'd say this was the hardest Final Fantasy that I played. Um, the NES ones were hard for various reasons related to the era of gaming they came out in, you know, the, the, but the pixel remasters of them are not particularly difficult. And even replaying the original NES FF1 was extremely easy when I did it again after playing 16. Yeah, that version I could save state in dungeons, but I didn't find it as difficult as this. The bosses in this game required planning and paying attention and quick reflexes on like on when to change your modes, how to approach it. You really had to have a plan. And I'm sure the hardest raid bosses in, in 14 and 11 are, are really the hardest things that any Final Fantasy game has. But I didn't play those, and of course I, I didn't do all the hardest possible things in every game. But to just play a game on normal mode, this was the hardest Final Fantasy um, of the ones that I played. I stopped and did some grinding at one point, and you know, chat, rec chat recommended this point. It was actually it was actually kind of fun. By that point, I was getting into the system enough, and I liked learning how to maximize my efficiency in that fight because it was kind of a long fight. And you know, when I had the second Bart fight, I really like that I felt like I'd advanced enough to get to it and win on the first try. After I had struggled immensely on the first fight with him, by the end I was just raffle stomping, you know, just about everything except the final boss's second form, which was appropriately hard. And so for the characters in this game, I liked Fang and Vanille a lot, even though Vanille's outfit didn't make any sense compared to anyone around, and no one was commenting on why her outfit was so weird, and her combat noises were also very unsettling. Um, Saj took a while to grow on me, but I liked him once I did. Now, Hope was mostly absurdly annoying, and his desire for revenge didn't even really make sense. Snow was even less appealing than Hope, and I hated him from the start. Uh, he sat on the bench for most of the game. Lightning, of course, is the really controversial character here, and the main thing I knew uh, about why people didn't like this game is that people would dismiss her as just being a female cloud. I'd heard, the I'd heard the writers themselves had even described her like that. I don't know if that's true, but I heard it, and I'm not going to look that up because I told you we don't look things up for these games. Uh, but she really isn't. You know, there's just an homage at the start where they're on a train and they fight a scorpion robot, and she's gruff to everybody while pointedly saying she's an ex-soldier. But after that opening, she really had almost nothing in common with Cloud. My real complaint about her character is that her personality is mostly just grim determination. Her motivation of saving her sister doesn't really change or evolve much. She just starts in one place and continues there until the game ends, despite lightening up a little bit with some of the other characters. She's mostly the adults trying to keep the rowdy rest of the team on track. I think her model design is pretty great, even if it doesn't seem overly practical. After three games, I ended up pretty fond of her as a character, but I'm not sure how I would describe her personality beyond being stoic and mission-oriented. I noted to myself multiple times that my feelings seesawed a lot with this game, as some parts are interesting, some are frustrating, they could be challenging in an unfun way, then challenging in a fun way, and, and so on, but I ended up really liking it. This may also be the prettiest Final Fantasy game. The locations are gorgeous, the designs for them are fantastic, the backgrounds and cutscenes look truly phenomenal. 16 suffers a bit on that because its setting is mostly depressing, decaying world, whereas this one is bright crystals and vibrant cities. You know, when 16 wants to be pretty, it's obviously prettier, you know, it's, it's got a decade and a half um, of technolog technological improvement over this, but it really, it really wants to the way this game does. 
And I wish I'd been saving full quality videos back when I was streaming this game because these same stream videos get a little too blurry with all the movement. Uh, so I can't show it quite as well on some of these scenes as I'd like to. But the ending, it's so, so pretty. And it's just a very nice, satisfying ending. Until the sequel decides to retcon it. Final Fantasy XIII 2, a surprisingly good sequel. So earlier in the video, I had nice things to say about Ten Two. You know, it's a perfectly cromulent game. It was so much better than Four After Years, but it was well below the level of any of the main numbered games with, you know, an asterisk for Eleven. Thirteen Two, on the other hand, felt more like Thirteen. It felt like it belonged. It still feels like a bit, a tiny bit of a production quality dip compared to Thirteen, with Thirteen as the big headline game. But it still far exceeded my expectations, and you know, a large portion of playing it, playing it, I was having more fun than I was having at comparable points in 13. When I ended it, I actually said that was more fun than 13. In retrospect, I'd changed that a little bit, but that's how I felt at the time. Uh, so a big reason for that is that we're back to an RPG where you can explore. After the initial combat tutorial, you immediately get more NPCs to converse with than 13 gave you in total. You can walk around and do little side quests from NPCs who aren't just dead stones, something you just didn't get in 13. So this does reuse 13's assets a lot for monster models, but it doesn't feel like it does so quite as haphazardly as 10 2 did. You're not fighting iron giants early on. In fact, while there is a behemoth early-ish, you're meant to run and hide from it rather than it just being a normal fight. I ended up fighting it and taming it, mostly because I got lost and just did tons of side quests first and was able to, uh, which was super fun and it made me enjoy the game so much because I was glad it would let me do that and I liked feeling like I got away with something by now having this pet uh, behemoth. And taming monsters is the big inno innovation for this game over 13. You now only have two characters who stay in your party, Sarah and Noel, and your third party member at any given time is a monster companion you tame in combat. There are a lot of these, and it gave it a fun little Pokemon vibe. Um, I say as someone who has not played a Pokemon game in the original Red and Blue. I have, I have actually not played um, a proper Pokemon game, I think, since Red and Blue. Uh, yes, there are a lot of these companions, and their usefulness varies. I don't remember why I looked it up at some point, but I saw on the internet what some of the better ones were. And you know, it really did make a difference when I switched to those, even if I really hated the sirens. So the roles are back. You know, those companions have preset roles, but this time you don't get a game over if your lead character dies. It really feels like they improved on the system from the first game. The Crystarium is back, although it's structured in a much clearer and easier to navigate way. I thought this was a big improvement, although it was exhausting. Um, and near the end, you know, I had... Uh, I, it, though I was exhausting it near the end, and I didn't even do that big a, per a percentage of the side material, the random encounters now work differently. Uh, in 12 and 13, there were just monsters instead of random encounters. Here they do spawn in front of you, and you have a chance to engage them swiftly and get an advantage in the encounter, or try a run and make things worse for you if you get caught. This has its pluses and minuses. It means exploring has a bit of a cost again compared to having not having respawns or random encounters, but it's a neat way to do random encounters since you can just walk away more easily most of the time if you want to. At first I was annoyed to have random encounters back, but it did grow on me. There are really three characters for this game. Sarah, Noel, and your Moogle weapon voiced by the middle child from Modern Family, uh, where I thought it was a robot, but then it was with other Moogles in Lightning Returns, and I'm not going to look up what it really is. This will forever remain a mystery to me. The Moogle is a fun character, and I adore Moogles. A friend of mine made me a Moogle doll while I was doing this marathon that I showed off at the end of the game. Uh, Sarah and Noel are both extremely likable leads. The villain Caius is also engaging. And having the protagonist be voiced by Laura Bailey and the antagonist by Liam O'Brien was just also a delight that I never tired of. One thing I really liked about the dynamic between the leads is that there's no romantic tension. It's so rare to have men and women just be allies and friends like this in a game. Sarah has her fiancé, Snow, from the last game, and Noel has a lost love, so it makes a lot of sense. Early on, I was worried they were going to try to ship the characters, since Noel has a few odd lines hinting in that direction when Snow comes up. But it's possible he was just being protective of Sarah, since Snow's behavior in this game is very weird. And Snow spent the whole last game trying to unfreeze Sarah because he just loves her so much. And then this game just kind of disappears before it starts. And when you find him, they squabble a bit and he just doesn't come with you. I, uh, thankfully, it's not building towards Sarah leaving him for Noel. It maintains them as just allies, and I like that a lot. And so speaking of the ending of the last game, this game does commit what I regard as a cardinal sin of sequels, which is messing up the ending of the original. It retcons the beautiful, happy-ish ending of the original to have Lightning disappear for no reason and get sent to a land outside of time and no one else, she wasn't really there at the ending, or maybe she was, and I wasn't fond, I wasn't fond of this, as there were plenty of ways they could have had her end up there without having to alter everyone's memories except Sarah and then effectively retcon the ending of 13. 
the overall plot with infinite yules doesn't really make a ton of sense, but it doesn't get in the way too much. You get to time travel, but unlike, say, Chrono Trigger, instead of fixing things in the future, you just create branching timelines. I liked this rarer interpretation of time travel where the terrifying realities just exist forever. The dystopian nightmare future will always exist because it happened once, and I thought that was just, it was nice, nice that they committed to that. So the graphics here feel like a definite step down from the last game, and that makes sense. The main numbered games are big events, and the sequels, however well made they are, are just not given the same resources. I played the Steam version of this, and it had a few technical issues. The biggest one was that it was crashing the game during cinematics, something the Steam Chrono Trigger also used to do for me some years back. The way to fix this is to desync your saves from Steam, but when I did that, I had to replay the first two hours again. So if you play this one, start with your saves desynced. For some reason, my speakers also just wouldn't work with it, and so I had to use headphones, which was better for the audio quality on my streams, but I liked listening to them out of the speakers. This game has an annoying go find the Triforce pieces quest later on, which reminded me of the worst part of Wind Waker. I'm a little surprised it was even in there. There are a few fun puzzles in this game, and some clock puzzles. I stumbled into the last and hardest clock puzzle first, which was an utter nightmare. It had me just look up a tool online to solve it for me. When I found the normal ones in order, they were laughably easy compared to that. Also, I randomly entered a code correctly without even realizing it was a puzzle, so, you know, that was great. Overall, this game was much easier than 13. I struggled at an early boss I wasn't actually supposed to be fighting yet, and I had to come back to it, but then I was pretty overleveled and I had the Behemoth Companion, and most of the game was pretty easy. The final boss was really hard, which feels like a proud Final Fantasy tradition that they seem to keep in the remasters, where everything else sort of gets easier as they level you up faster, but then the final boss is still hard. At least that's been my perception from my own experience playing it and from watching other people play them. I think the final boss here is harder than the final boss of 13, or at least I really struggled. I felt like I struggled on it more. I like hard final bosses that require me to really buckle down in figuring it out, and this one did that. You know, it wasn't like the one in 12 where I, I still just don't know what the mechanics were, and it just sort of died. When I finished the game, I thought, as I said, it was more enjoyable than 13, although I did think the ending is the worst in the series up to this point. Um, I'm not sure if I'd still say it's the worst, but it was definitely the worst um, prior to one that I played after this. This game is not as deep as 13, and I couldn't really call it a better game, but I enjoyed it more. Look, you know, looking back many months later, it hasn't quite aged quite as favorably in my memory. It was shorter, it feels a bit forgotten to me compared to 13 Lightning Returns, sort of sandwiched between those. But while playing it, I had a fantastic time, and I will also say I felt pretty done with the role mechanic by the end, which is why it's really good that the next game mixes it up. Lightning Returns. Okay, hear me out. I've never had a game try so hard to get me to stop playing in the first few hours. This game makes the worst first impression of any Final Fantasy game, except for trying to get Eleven to run. It's not even that the early gameplay is bad, the game just tries very hard to convince you that the rest of the game will not be fun. It's so successful at this that the streamer Jesse Cox just straight up quit the game and ended his video with a discussion of how awful it seemed a couple hours in. And right where he stopped is in fact the nadir of the game, the point where I too thought it was going to be a miserable playing experience. But as I said, the gameplay to that point wasn't terrible. The intro corridor, which is an actual corridor, introduces the new mechanics well, it keeps things moving. The problem is the first day slash night and what Hope tells you about how the game is going to play out. It doesn't help that the setting is weird and it's not at all like the prior 13 trilogy games. You just jump forward 500 years and now there's this town that looks more like an old European town as it might have been in the mid 20th century rather than the futuristic setting of the trilogy so far and you know that takes some getting used to. But the real problem with this game, and if there's one thing you know about this game, it's probably this, is the timer. You have 13 days to save the world, and there's a timer going down the whole time except between days. And unlike Majora's Mask, you can't reset time at all. So if you are inefficient, you, get your, you can get your save file locked to a bad ending, at least in theory. After the first day, Hope and Lightning have an exchange about how you have to prioritize people to save and how you, 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 you just don't get to do all of the side quests because you won't have time. It manages to be written in the most boring way possible as well, which, you know, it couches it in economics terms, and I like economics, and, you know, it put me off. So after they finally let you go around and do side quests again in the last game, this game starts off by telling you you'll be punished if you do them here. 
And this is contrary to the reason we, or at least I think I think most of us, play Final Fantasies, which is taking the time to wander around and talk to NPCs and explore. The timer takes all of this from us and makes us feel bad for doing the things we like in these games. In theory, you can use the New Game Plus feature if you get the bad ending and you want to get stronger and stronger until you're strong enough to get the good ending, but having to replay the whole game over and over to not get the bad ending sounded awful. I wasn't sure if I'd do a New Game Plus or just accept a bad ending if that's what I got, since I didn't have time to replay the whole thing. And this game makes you think you're going to have less time than you do. The first day starts out at 9 p.m. instead of 6 a.m., so you think all your days are going to be shorter than they end up being. It also manages to stick an auto-fail stealth mission in, something that I, I don't believe appears anywhere else in the game, thankfully. And it's a personal pet peeve of mine. Everybody hates auto-fail stealth missions. Why do they exist? Yeah. Chat was a little backseaty early on as well for this one. Um, you know, having people tell you, oh, you should be in this area. Oh, haven't you gone to that area already? Why haven't you? I haven't even heard about them. It's the first day. I don't know what's happening. Time is short. Why are you doing this to me? You know, when, when I saw Jesse Cox's video about it, he also lamented that, you know, he bought a guide and it was telling him, oh, you should have already done these things by the end of the first night. And he's barely figured out, you know, any bit of the exploration. You learn that some of the areas are also dependent on the time of day. So if you show up too late for something, as I did by about one minute at one point, you have to waste the entire rest of the day to try to advance that part of the plot. The worst part of this is that there's this one area where there's a gate that's only open at weird hours uh, in the starting city. I hated anything that made me go there. And the only quest, I believe the only quest I just straight up failed was because I just couldn't find a time to get there until it had expired. When you add all of that up and the game is, the game is just telling you, he doesn't want you to have fun. And so I agonized while I was playing it. Do I do the new game plus to get the good ending? Have I really finished the game if I've gotten the bad ending? How much should I reload after something bad happens so I don't waste time in the game? Well, in reality, I did you know, every side quest except for a couple that were either meant for a new game plus or, as I said, because I accidentally let someone die and I failed it because they were in that place and I don't want to go there. And I still had four days left at the end of this game. I did this by just looking up where the quests were after a while. I understand some may refuse to kind of want to do that. It's not really very spoilery. I just was you know, clicking on guides and seeing where where do I find this. I felt like the timer you know, made it forgivable to just look up where things were. I will say that the design and structure of the game mechanics punishes you so much for exploring without a goal or any, you know, wasting time or experimenting that, you know, looking a few things up did feel a little necessary for this one. But if you do look things up, the timer's not so bad. You don't need to look up everything. The game has plenty of surprises. You know, I wasn't banging my head against the wall trying to figure things out through trial and error, and that just seemed prudent, and it made the game a lot more fun. The other reason that a timer isn't so bad is that you have this ability called chronostasis that just stops time from passing. It costs you this resource, so at first I just wasn't using it, but later I learned that you can replenish that resource by fighting monsters, and if you just you know, chronostasis nonstop and fight everything in front of you, the game gives you well more time than you need. And, you know, these games sometimes have an issue where what you're supposed to do to enjoy it isn't very obvious, or it's presented in a way that just makes it seem wasteful. You know, you're led to believe your EP won't replenish as easily as it does, and so you might not be using it. Just know that you're supposed to spam this ability uh, until you want time to advance, and then just fight monsters to earn back the EP, and you're going to have a much more fun uh, time in this game. By the time I beat the game, I ranked at the top of the 13 trilogy. I wanted to play more. I wanted that new game plus. I only didn't do it because I had to keep going to finish in time for 16, as I beat this game in mid-April 2023. But I did, I am sure, uh, the most side material in this game of like any Final Fantasy from 10 to 15. Uh, this one gets the Final Fantasy VIII award of being a game that's no fun when you don't know what you're doing and very fun when you do. But the game doesn't direct you to the fun very well. Mechanics-wise, this is where the series moves to a single character you're controlling, unless you count 11, which I, I wouldn't, in that sense, it's one of the biggest inflection points in the series, as it won't go back to multiple parties again unless you count the 7 remake. It's also a midway point to where the games become action RPGs. You have to time attacks and shield blocks, and it's actually very satisfying when you get good at the timing. I really enjoy the gameplay in combat. You change your stances instantly without the Sailor Moon-style transformations of the other 13 trilogy games, and that reminded me very pleasantly of switching party members in and out in 10. Changing stances happens frequently as your ATB recharges faster in the stances that you're not in. So you equip abilities to buttons on the controller. It can be a little annoying when your garb doesn't quite allow you to do what you want. But overall, it's a very fun system. Upgrading them is complicated enough. It took me a while to understand what exactly I was supposed to be doing. I'd like a better interface for that. But getting to combine weaker abilities into stronger ones is always fun. I liked it in Kingdom Hearts, and I liked it here. 
uh, even if it could have been implemented more smoothly. And so staggering is back. Um, you know, there are nuances to how it works in this game that I didn't learn until the final phase of the final boss for reasons that will make sense if you fought the final boss. But I felt like the mechanic worked well with while iterating on the previous games. The encounter mechanic is neat, where monsters spawn semi-randomly, and attacking them first gives you a bonus, and getting hit by them gives you a penalty, or you can just run past them a lot like in 13-2. But one amazing innovation in this game that I loved was the last one mechanic. Basically, every type of enemy has a finite number in the world that can spawn. After you've exhausted that supply, a special pink Omega one appears. When this happens, I did, you know, it happened to me for the first time, and I didn't even know it was a feature. I just got confused. This one is going to be harder than normal, and the first time I, you know, I had that with a behemoth, I literally could not damage it enough to kill it, given its regeneration. But I loved this mechanic. The hard one at the end felt nice. The ability to clear out an entire type of bad guys so it wouldn't keep spawning on you felt like a good accomplishment. Plus, the last ones drop really great loot. In theory, you could have a problem running out of EP for chronostasis if you exterminated every monster and had nothing else to fight, but I don't know how exactly that would even manage to play out. I didn't come close to having that be an issue. There's also a neat optional final dungeon that's easier if you've done all of the last ones. I, I really liked it. The monster models themselves are mostly reused as they were in 13.2, but this is the same world, and it does make sense for them to be reused the way they are, plus some of them are new. The outfits you use that basically determine what stance you're in have some wild designs. I like some more than others. Some are more revealing in ways that are just weird, and some are amazing. The story is the weakest part of this game, as you're working for God, with hope as an intermediary, doing side quests to save souls before the apocalypse comes in 13 days. Part of why this is weak is that it, it felt in each 13 sequel that they're retconning some new god or mythos that wasn't present in the earlier ones. They felt weirdly disconnected at times. The big bosses are major characters from the last games, like Snow and Caius, whose souls require beating them. The Null fight, which I did first, did something a boss fight should do, and it made me stop, made me learn the mechanics, and reconfigure my character in order to beat him. Chat was very helpful explaining how some different weapons worked and why I might want one that was nearby that I should be using instead. Supposedly, these fights get harder if you do them in later days, except for Kai, who just starts off unbelievably hard. His fight is absolutely brutal, and beating him felt like a huge accomplishment. I also thought the resolution of his story was perfect for his character. And as for Lightning's character herself, her personality is still kind of hard to describe or pin down, really. In fact, part of the plot of this game is that she feels like her emotions are draining away. I, I still like her as a character. It's just odd that it feels like, if you ask me to describe her, I wouldn't have that much to say. So I can see why this game was so controversial, both because it tells you not to have fun early on, and because if you look at the timeline, you know, FF12 came out in 2006, FF14 was an MMO, and FF15 came out in 2016. So if you're a Final Fantasy fan who doesn't like MMOs and didn't like the way the 13 games operated, you had 10 years before you got another normal Final Fantasy after 12. I can absolutely understand fatigue at that point. But playing the 13 trilogy over the span of two months, that was great. So I played the Steam version, and I didn't have any technical issues with this one, unlike uh, some of the last few games, as I mentioned. Overall, I was really impressed by how much I enjoyed this game, especially given my expectations. I don't know if it's the biggest gap I have had between expectations and enjoyment of all the Final Fantasies, but it's up there. Final Fantasy XIV. A very different MMO. So if you skipped to this part, and you didn't watch what I said about Eleven, the key thing to know here is that I don't like MMOs very much. I do, but I also don't. I played EverQuest for you know, about a year when it was released in World of Warcraft from the day it came out until mid-2012. MMOs are addictive, their highs can be very high. Thousand Needles and Original WoW or Storm Peaks and Wrath of the Lich King, those were, those were places that just gave me such great memories. But you're playing for so many hours between those moments. There's just so much needless drudgery. I'm paying for the whole month whether I play 200 hours or one hour, I'd rather not feel like I have to play 200. And the online nature of it, I usually found more of a problem than a bonus. I, I didn't like grouping up with strangers then, and I don't like it now. And it can be hard to get all of your friends, you know, actually together. So the time, the only times that I would ever really play with people, well, those were pretty rare. I regretted wasting the hours I did raiding in Vanilla WoW, even if Molten Core was a really cool experience my first couple of times. But I really loved going through in Cataclysm before I quit, just crushing the old raids that I never finished you know, with my brother when we were massively overleveled for them, especially when the bow dropped and killed Jaden while the hunter in the guild was AFK and didn't join the party. Good times. 
really what I wanted instead of EverQuest was basically just Skyrim. Skyrim with friends occasionally popping in and out. And 14 makes, makes group dungeons much less miserable than they were in those other games, and it just lets you have bots that are fully competent, which is really all I ever wanted in EverQuest or World of Warcraft. But the dungeons themselves are just kind of boring grind fests. The bosses are very fun, they're very neat, I love the telegraph moves, you know, it's, it's like the add-ons you were basically required to have in WoW. A lot of the boss mechanics are, are neat, they're cool, but everything leading up to them, it just annoyed me as a waste of my time. The mechanics of MMOs in general are not for me. After seven years of World of Warcraft, I hate the rotation of standing still while casting a 2.5 second spell, then moving, then casting a bunch of universal cooldown abilities, then casting the 2.5 second spell again. It's probable that Summoner is not what I should have been when I started playing this game. Uh, it just gave me too many flashbacks all the time I wasted in WoW, and it was just not remotely engaging to me mechanically. I'm not excited at the thought of bearing down and optimizing each tiny fraction of a percent of damage. I later switched to a Red Mage, which was a lot more fun, but still far below the combat in any other Final Fantasy game except for Eleven. So I was playing uh, 14 for the story, which is after all what it's praised for, and I'd already seen people play Endwalker's story, so I hadn't seen the rest of it as set up, so I knew some of where it was going, but not why it mattered or, or how that was happening. So right now, all I've played is A Realm Reborn, because A Realm Reborn has the credits roll when you finish the main story. That was enough to meet my general project goal for this game. Originally, I was just going to play both MMOs for one stream's worth, but 14 is supposed to get so great that I thought I should see all the main scenario quests. I only finished the Realm Reborn arc and didn't get to the expansions because, I mean, it's an MMO. This is going to take a million years to finish. I do intend to do the expansions eventually. I hear Shadowbringers is one of the best stories in any video game ever, and I want to see it. But in Realm Reborn, the story just kind of existed. The whole thing just felt like set up and not really a game on its own. That was probably the intent and the expectation, but it was a lot of fetch quests. I mean, pray return thee to the waking sands. I stopped where I did because time ran out basically. I didn't want to hold off on this video for the months it would take to finish 14. By that time, my memories of the other games would be less fresh, and the momentum for this would have, would have just cratered. I didn't quite get to the end credits of 14 in time for 16, despite a great effort and a lot of hours in it, because right at the end, the main story quest paused to tell me I needed to gain two levels to continue without clear directions on where to go level. This was right at the end, which meant I needed to level grind in an MMO, and I would have had to have done it on my birthday in order to finish before 16 came out, because 16 came out at the end of my birthday. And, mmm, I, I had enough self-respect not to level grind an MMO on my birthday. So, in a way, it would have been an anti-birthday, like growing younger, as it would have been a throwback to what, what I was like in my early to mid-20s. But that was something I have regrets about in terms of spending my time, and I do not like level grinding in MMOs. So I decided to just move on to 16 and return to this one later. I got to the end credits after 16 for Realm Reborn, played a little bit beyond that, and then stopped to work on other projects. I'd initially played this game for a couple of hours, I think several years back, because all my friends were talking about it and saying how great it was. I stopped because some quest, quest required me to have a hat to advance the story, and I didn't know where to find a hat, or and my attention just drifted. The big choke point on all of my entertainment sources is time. MMOs represent a fantastic value of dollars for hours of content when 10 to 15 dollars gives you 100 or so hours of activity that month. But most of that time isn't fun. A Realm Reborn, had it been a single player Final Fantasy game, would have been bottom tier. I mean, I would rank it only above After Years and Eleven. It's just so much running around in fetch quests, and the story has, you know, neat moments, but none are remotely on the level of just any other single player Final Fantasy. You know, I, I'd take the back massage in 10-2 over this, from a gameplay perspective. This was mechanically boring most of the time, but it wasn't actively unpleasant, like figuring out things in 11 was. I felt comfortable, you know, I, f I felt comfortable giving 11 a bad grade. And while I, I say I was bored by the mechanics, it wasn't, I wasn't miserably bored in 14. I just got less joy out of the 24 hours of gameplay that I, that I have at this point than I did for any of the non-After Years, non-11 Final Fantasies. I did get joy, though. You know, some of the areas gave me EverQuest vibes of being cool places off in the distance that you can look at. You know, the aesthetics of this game are phenomenal. The music is phenomenal. It's filled with cues from the earlier games that I got to appreciate now that I'd played them all. But, you know, I have to give this an incomplete, and it's an incomplete on my part. You know, not a bad grade. Unlike Eleven, I will be coming back to it, and I'm excited to see what else it can offer. Final Fantasy XV. I thought it was kind of a mess. So, okay. I'm going to start by saying that I enjoyed Final Fantasy XV. 
but the game feels really unpolished in a structural way. It's just weird. The flow was even odder than 13, which is really saying something. My expectations for this game were paradoxically set both too high and too low. They were too high because a friend said she thought it perfected the Kingdom Hearts combat system, and I had just played the Kingdom Hearts games a few months earlier, and I really loved them, so I expected to love this one too, but in practice, I did not end up liking the combat at all. My expectations were conversely too low because of Conan O'Brien's famous Clueless Gamer covering the game when it came out. I saw it back when it aired in 2016, back at a point when you know, I hadn't played a Final Fantasy after 7. From the outside, the series seemed to have moved in a weird direction, all of which seemed confirmed by what Conan was experiencing. Um, when Aaron Blair told him that the Adamantois fight would take 72 hours, I completely believed this. You know, I'd played so many time-wasting things in MMOs, I'd heard how ridiculously large some RPGs had gotten, and so from that perspective, the idea of a 72-hour fight wasn't beyond plausibility for me. Even though I assumed it had stages and pauses and would be more like a level, that might be the most infamous part of that Conan segment, and I have absolutely no idea where the 72-hour claim came from. I've googled it, and people have speculated, but I, I don't know who told him that or what he was basing it on when the actual length is apparently closer to about an hour. But my first impression of this game was that it was the apotheosis of the time-wasting, bloated RPG. He even said he had to jump the game forward because it was slow and plotting and pointless, and ending up in another part that was slow and plotting and pointless. And stylistically, you know, this game is a modern, slightly futuristic setting where the characters look less fantastical and more like a boy band, as is often observed. Which is fine, but if you bear in mind that I loved the series when it was Terra and Cecil, and you know I left it when it was spiky-haired Modern Cloud, you can kind of see my aversion. Still, by the time I was starting it, I had high hopes. The combat system sounded fun, and after the 13 games, I had acclimated to the more modern appearance. My immediate impression, sadly, was that it felt clunky. I was playing it on Steam in April 2023 with a PS5 controller, and you know I didn't experience too many technical issues, except you know it crashed during the Arden DLC, and I had to spend an eternity getting back to where I was. But it just felt kind of clunky. I, I had the immediate impression that the graphics felt worse than 13, at least for the backgrounds and setting, and that modern look, well, you know, it never really worked for me. In 7, it was just enough off from the 20th century to not feel like I was just seeing the 20th century, both by being more advanced in Midgar and less advanced outside of it. It didn't feel like we were just watching now. FF8 was probably the closest prior game to just feeling like it looked like part of the 20th century if you exclude certain parts of, you know, the first town in Lightning Returns. But, you know, 8 at least had this weird floating school, it had space guns, and, and 13 was still science fiction-y on the whole. This one just felt like the real world. You know, the product placement didn't help, uh, even when I wasn't completely familiar with what some of the products were. And I, I did laugh when I saw the Coleman stuff in the store shortly after purchasing this, though. Um, you know, it, it, this game has Magitek robots, but they just kind of look like Earth. And they look like human robots. So the road trip aspect of this game, that is my favorite part. The Regalia, the car you drive, you know, it's a fun little addition. I like its auto drive. The stuff people say while well, driving it is entertaining. You find fun side quests along the way and so on. The best part is that it has audio to play music from earlier Final Fantasy games. You can buy those CDs at rest stops. It even tells you how long the drive will be. So you can get a snack or use the restroom. You can just fast travel if you want, if you want that later. I didn't like that the day-night was particularly relevant because it really tries to make you stop having fun when night hits. It felt primarily like an inconvenience wasn't that big of an issue on the whole, but it was an inconvenience. And the road trip part just sort of stops. I went off to what I thought was a side segment in another area, and I expected to come back later when I could do the quests that were much higher level than I was. But instead, you never come back. There's a brief city uh, exploration without the car, and then you're just more or less on rails for the rest of the game. Just literally on rails for a while. And that was so weird. I only found out very late in the game that you're supposed to go back to the road trip part by using a dog and a, a memory book, and you, you just kind of pretend you did those things before, but at the level you are now with the appearance and outfits that you have now. And when, when I got the dog, I thought it was just a way to replay boss fights like in Lightning Returns, and I had to have Chad explain to me what you're really supposed to do. And the on-rails portion was just weak. It's one of the most dreaded parts of a video game. The, we took your gear and abilities, and now you have to play this game some other way. 
They just give you a ring and it's just slow to use and boring and clunky. I didn't get it. Not that any of the mechanics really matter because this is the easiest Final Fantasy by a wide margin. I think I died once because I wasn't paying attention. And outside of that, I, I think the only other time I died was in one of the DLCs where they just, it just functions very differently and was genuinely challenging. But basically, as long as you have potions and elixirs, you just can't die. So, you know, just buy a lot of them and you can't lose. If there was any subtlety or nuance to the combat, I did not see it. I just spammed whatever, used potions, and things died. The warp strike looked fun, but in practice it was just a button to press until the battle ended. You had to run far off in the distance, then use it again, and it was a lot more movement than I felt was necessary. The battles weren't so much hard as just saying, well, I used more potions than I wanted to. I will say that un until I realized it was letting me do that, battles were a little tense, because I thought something bad could happen. You know, I think 16 would later perfect the technique of making a fight seem like it could be difficult, but it's actually quite easy and you are going to win, but you think you can lose. I don't think I thought I could lose very often in this game, after the beginning. And so staggering is kind of back with enemies that become vulnerable, but it just seemed to happen sometimes, and if there was a mechanic to learn for it, I, I didn't. On my version, I, I noticed that I had some other gear with just better stats when I just was looking at my inventory, including a sword called Ragnarok, and I only realized much later that that was somehow D DLC content that I got because I was buying the Windows version that had been out for a million years, thanks to the Steam version being seven years old. Uh, that was, again, quite confusing. I should add that I hate fishing minigames, and this game makes you do it. Or did it make me, it made me look at it, I don't know. Then I tried it, and it was painful, and then I tried another place, and it was even more painful there, and I, I don't like fishing games in, in video games. I, I, I just had to, I had to fish again later because I couldn't afford to feed a cat. It was... <sighs> Final Fantasy VI had the only good fishing mini game, and mostly because it's designed for you to fail it the first time and get emotional. The royal arms in this game are bizarre. They make it seem like a collect the 13 items of awesomeness and the way will open, but instead I just got two or three and I just didn't see any more and the game stopped talking about them. And I didn't find them. And yeah, it just kind of went away. So I do want to add that despite these frustrations, I was really enjoying the game. I was mostly mocking it, you know, I was, I was playing in a happy way. Uh, the biggest problem I, I had was that the game just kept taking me away from the fun parts randomly. I enjoyed many of the side quests, you know, getting on a chocobo and hunting something down. I just stayed away from fishing after a while. And the DLCs in this game are pretty good. You know, they're included with the Steam version. They're pretty, they're pretty, they're neat. They fill you in with what the side characters were doing during the events of the main game. The only problem is it's just not great at stopping you and saying, okay, now stop what you're doing in this part of the plot and go play Gladiolus's DLC. Because they take place in different, different points. There's also different kinds of games in the main game, with Gladiolus as being 95% of the game's challenge, because you can't just buy potions. Promptos is a shooter, and Ignis is just fun. The Arden one you should only play after you beat the game, but it was even better. And speaking of 72-hour fights, uh, Leviathan. This is not a hard fight, and I wasn't even really aware if it was supposed to be considered a fight. It's really just meant to be a moment showing you how badass you are, and you're getting and feeling powerful. But unfortunately, it lasts about three times too long to do that, and it just gets tedious. I thought I was a third of the way through the game, and all of a sudden the game asked if I wanted to fight the final boss. And this was right you know, when I went back and I learned how to remember things that I hadn't done. But then I got stuck in a maze to get better headlights, and I, it, was, it was so unpleasant that I tired of doing side quests, kind of like in FF12 when I had to cross a river and needed to get to another side of a town, and then I couldn't get them to let me cross the river, and then I had to do a bunch of other side quests, and those led to more side quests to do those side quests, and I just stopped playing. So I watched the Kingsglaive movie, and I thought it was fine. It, you know, it was neat to see the concepts in the game depicted that way, um, particularly the monsters. The main plot wasn't really needed, though. I, I wish it had just been the king and Luna Freya. Waiting for Sid to upgrade things was... I didn't see the point. I wish I hadn't randomly found the last Ultima Blade piece, because then I had to wait for him to make it. Now, there's not much to say about the characters. Noctus is generic chosen protagonist. Gladiolus is the heavy with a backstory and a dash of old mentor. Except his advice is terrible, and it doesn't make any sense. Prompto annoyed the heck out of me, even though child him looks exactly like I did at that age. He has a, a good backstory, and his DLC is good, which made me like it more. Ignis is obviously the favorite. Uh, and to this day in Baldur's Gate 3, I use his voice to say, I have discovered a new recipe. Oh, and um, Aranea is amazing. There's just not enough of her. And she feels like she belongs in another game in terms of both design and gameplay. The weakest story part of the game is that Noctis and Luna Frey don't spend any time together. You get some flashbacks, but it's impossible for me to picture them as a couple or to care about it. 
It felt, again, like they just kind of left that part out. However, Arden might be one of my favorite Final Fantasy characters. I love his motivation. I love his backstory. His dialogue is great. He interacts with you a lot. He's voiced by Darren DePaul. His DLC, as I said, is also the best. I mean, I'd rank him highly among Final Fantasy villains. So, to summarize, this game is weird. It feels kind of jumbled and unfinished, like it needed a few more drafts. It never really coheres, and it's too easy. But the good parts are very good and quite enjoyable. Final Fantasy 16. We made it. All right, here we are, after all that buildup, after playing 19 prior games, how is the payoff of being there for the release of the latest entry in the series? It was pretty good. You know, I, I played the demo when it came out, and it both raised and lowered my expectations for the game. It raised them because the controls felt great, the combat was fun, most of the things I thought I might not like about the mechanics turned out not to be true. Uh, the controls were much better than Final Fantasy XV, and they didn't involve the secret of monostyle pauses to cast spells that Seven Remake had. The graphics were amazing, the designs for classic monsters like goblins and morbles were great, the voice acting was great, the setting seemed interesting, but it lowered my expectations because of the ending. Oof, the ending to the demo was rough. Uh, I came out of it not nearly as excited for the game. And that's because the ending is really brutal. I was already on the fence about hearing this one was grittier and the idea that it's for the Game of Thrones era, well, half a decade after the Game of Thrones era, but you know what I mean. Thankfully, while the game is extremely dark and depressing, the ending of the demo goes a little further than it usually does in forcing you to watch it be rough over a prolonged period of time. It's still relentlessly grim and sad, but not in the same kind of horrible way as watching Ifrit kill Phoenix. After that, it changes to be depressing because the world is horrible and grotesquely unjust. It'll enrage you, but it's not the kind of wincing that I made at the end of the demo. Plus, looking back on it after playing Baldur's Gate 3, the M rating here is actually kind of tame by comparison. And Final Fantasy XVI's depressing setting can go on for so long that you just kind of become numb to it. There's a great moment in Preach LFW's playthrough where he gets to a late game quest that's depressing, but it's come so far out the other side, it's just become comical. And he also noted that other Final Fantasy games can get pretty dark, but they also have light, fun moments that break it up. But 16 just really doesn't have those. And I think he's right. The game has comical moments, and they're good, but they're usually still wrapped in serious scenes, and they mostly involve Clive's uncle. There's no pervert octopus, no golden sock saucer, no getting turned into a pig, not even any blitzball. There's just no rest from the misery. I, I wonder if on some level all of those minigames that I used to hate could be some necessary catharsis to... Well, no, no. They're all still bad. At least Blitzball, and all the ones from Final Fantasy VII. So there was a lot of debate when the game came out about whether it was really Final Fantasy because of its gritty tone. I don't think anything goes so far that it makes me think this isn't a Final Fantasy game. It still has Moogles, and Morbles, and Ahriman, and Behemoths that Meteor as their death counters. And the story is pure Final Fantasy. You're traveling to Crystal so you can slay an evil god, which is about the most Final Fantasy thing you can get. It even has an ancient, highly advanced civilization that falls and leaves behind airships. But it does feel like it stands out a bit. I think it's closest to 13 in terms of tone. Although it's a little darker than even Lightning Returns, and it is missing some of the silliness that that game found time for. While I was playing it, though, I wasn't missing all that too much. Instead, I was really enjoying what it did have. The characters felt very fleshed out and realized. Clive is a tremendous Final Fantasy lead, and his voice actor, Ben Starr, does a phenomenal job with him. There isn't a single weak link in the cast. Although I'd love if someone could explain why people frequently stop speaking after the first clause in a conversation, and you just sort of read the text from there. But the voice acting that is there is great. I mean, this is the best Sid the series has ever given us. Jill is an absolute delight. I adore her outfit. Barnabas is a fantastic villain, and even Torgal has an arc. Ultima is a little generic as a Final Fantasy end boss, but they are visually striking, and their speech mannerisms lead to some wonderful moments. You're not getting a legend like Kefka or Sephiroth with Ultima, but you're not getting a Necron or a Cloud of Darkness either. And while I have wonderful things to say about the characters and story, with one big exception that I will come back to, it wouldn't have held my attention for 66 hours without solid gameplay. I found this game so addictive that I wanted to keep playing for far longer sessions than I normally do with games, and I just wanted to get back into combat and just use Ignition to bunch up enemies. It's such a great, wonderful, cathartic feeling using some of those moves. I do miss the turn-based combat of earlier games, but not long after this, Baldur's Gate 3 came out and it scratched that itch perfectly well, which makes it even easier to appreciate this game for what it is. My journey through the games in the lead-up to this showed me how much the series has moved towards a more action kind of combat, which really you could point to Lightning Returns for that. 
That's the game with its timed blocking that I cite is the real shift away from the ATB system, although 11, 12, 14 all had pretty standard MMO combat systems that aren't ATB, but they're not really action either. I was really hooked on the combat in Lightning Returns by the end, 15's combat disappointed me compared with Kingdom Hearts, and 7 remakes felt like a solid hybrid system, but 16's is just fun. It isn't hard, though, which is a bit of an issue. It's cathartic button mashing with some really fun rotations you can develop. I personally went for a high stagger build that didn't give bosses too long to do anything before being stunned again. But the lack of a challenge was a bit of a disappointment. In 13, I felt like I had to really master certain fights and plan for the nuances in them. Here, I don't recall my total number of deaths, but against bosses, it pretty much only happened by the second half if there was a way to get one shot and I just wasn't paying attention. It's not on the Final Fantasy XV level of being so easy it gets boring, and it does have one trick it pulls off well. While I didn't lose in these fights, I did think I might be able to lose, which kept them tense and interesting. Well, the non-Icon fights, at least. The Icon fights tended to be much, much too long. The Titan fight stands out the most for giving you this massive, absurd, over-the-top ending. You deal a ridiculous amount of damage to it, and then it just keeps going into this weird freefall segment that is really more boring than fun. If that fight had stopped before that part, I think I would have adored it. The Bahamut and Odin fights paced themselves a little bit better while also going completely nuts. They also could have been trimmed a little bit. The other big area of criticism for this game is the gearing system. It's just badly implemented in two major ways. First, the upgrades are so minor it's hard to get excited about them, and second, it's not really clear what role the crafting system is supposed to play. You just kind of find the Masamune despite already having crafted Ragnarok and Excalibur, and by the time you do, it's a downgrade. You're just constantly inundated with crafting materials that serve no clear purpose. If you just play the game, you'll have exactly what it asks for the moment a new thing becomes available. Unless it's gating a single item behind a bounty hunt you can't do yet. I'd rather just gave me the swords as rewards for those bounties. I understand that this way it can make it so that you have to do two bounties to get the upgrade, but it really could have just given each target half the sword or something. And the bounties were both one of my favorite parts of the game and a surprising weakness. The first S-tier bounty I just assumed was meant to be done much, much later, but then I would see streamers try it at about my level, and I decided, all right, I'll give it a whirl. And it was a blast. You know, uh, it, being a fight with lots of careful timing and awareness, the second S-tier fight against a dragon was probably the best fight in the game for how many tries it took and what it asked of me while still being fun and letting me feel like I'd improved when I beat it. But after that, you get lower tier bounties again, and the future S tier ones are so comically easy compared to the first two. I'd really rather they'd thrown in one or two extremely hard super bosses to try at the end. To some extent, you get that with the Echoes of the Fallen DLC, which I played when it came out half a year later. I died only once in the DLC on the final boss, but all the boss fights felt taxing, and they saw me actually using my potions and feeling a little nervous about my ability to restock them. Which does raise one interesting feature in this game. I'm not sure if it's good or bad. When you die in a boss fight, you go back to a certain checkpoint. There's, that's great. No notes. Every, every game that isn't trying to be Dark Souls should do that if the fight is beyond a certain length. That was my biggest issue with some of the bosses I disliked in some earlier games, and one of the things I particularly liked Final Fantasy XIII not making me do. The fear that dying would mean wasting a tremendous amount of time just to get back to the meat of the fight. And when you come back, instead of coming back with the items you had at that point, you come back with full HP and some amount of your items restocked. This is a huge relief while doing the fight, but it makes it a little bit easy. Indeed, I, I felt like it cheapened my victory against Benedicta when I found out that this was a feature, and I still kind of worry that I didn't really beat Omega because of it. I almost had that fight without getting my items and HP back, and it was almost pro forma to beat it once I did. It's hard for me to say that that's a bad feature, though. I mean, I'm going to take advantage of it. I think I'd prefer a series of mid-fight checkpoints that bring you back where you were at that point, and you can just go back to a separate save if you can't win from there. As it is, it, it just kind of felt like it let me win against Omega. The mechanics in this one share some stance changing with Lightning Returns and the basic attack structure of Final Fantasy VII Remake. I like that you get to customize your icon abilities, and seeing people play with very different builds was fascinating. As I said, mine was aimed at staggering bosses quickly and then staggering them again with less effort put on the damage during a stagger. The icons themselves do suffer from late-game party member addition syndrome, where you really get good with Phoenix and Garuda, and you're sort of learning Ramu, and then you get Titan, and you probably switch to that, and... I never liked the Ramu ones, but then Bahamut, Shiva, and especially Odin just kind of get short shrift because I was so comfortable with the ones I already had. Odin really wants you to go all in on Odin abilities, and I just wasn't interested in doing that at that phase of the game. I didn't have strong opinions about the nature of the game's talent tree one way or the other. It felt like maybe they could have done more with it, but I, I don't have specific suggestions on how they'd change it. 
The music is also fantastic. I, I bought the soundtrack and it was 181 tracks. That is wild. I most noticed and loved how the boss music was in a different style of music for each icon fight. Titan is very hard rock and metal, Bahamut sounds more classical, and Odin is extremely Wagnerian. You know, Soken knocks it out of the park yet again. As for the part of the story I hinted at not liking, that's the ending. Major spoilers here, but the ending really did a lot to hurt my memory of the game. I really, really hated the ending. I know not everybody did, but it's a style of ending I hate. I spent 66 hours with Clive, and at the end, I didn't know if he was alive or dead. And everyone on the internet thinks it's extremely clear, but they all have different answers. There's a hint, maybe he's supposed to become a writer, so maybe he wrote the book at the end under Joshua's name, but why would he do that? I mean, he, yeah, he assumed Sid's name, but why do that here? If the game had put Clive's name on the book, I, I'd be okay with it. Right. But you're introducing a weird ambiguity, as if Joshua's alive, and, and he's the one who wrote it, but, but then Clive did it under Joshua's name. I just find that to be the kind of thing that isn't emotionally satisfying and spawns countless dumb internet arguments. Personally, I prefer the Final Fantasy VIII and Final Fantasy IV style endings where you see what happens to everyone and you get a sense of the consequences of your actions throughout the game. This ending does not give me that. Final Fantasy XV was similar, but the result was at least clear and it had a great moment at the end, but they, they both kind of just annoyed me as just ending rather than concluding. I like an ending that makes me wonder what comes next, but not one that makes me wonder what I just saw. It's unfortunate because I had a great time playing this game and then left it with a sour taste in my mouth. And when I would see another streamer play it, I'd get wrapped back in by how great the game is and we get to the ending and I'd get annoyed all over again. But the DLC did let me play the game again without thinking about any of that and I thought it did a great job of exploring hinted at portions of the story. So in summary, it all led up to this game and I loved it. The ending aside, I have no major complaints that dampened my joy while playing it. It's an upper tier Final Fantasy game. I wouldn't put it in the topmost tier, but it's at least an A minus, probably an A. Well, that was that. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. If you somehow stuck around through all of this, well then, hi mom. I may post something recapping Seven Rebirth after that game is done, and I look forward to seeing what I can do with a video that's just covering one game. So, until next time.